I call to order the uh, town zoning co committee meeting for July 9th, 2018. The purpose of this segment of the zoning committee meeting is to review and discuss the public hearing held before town council on June 25th, 2018 on the sheets proposed amendment to, to the zoning code. As I told Toby Cordick, Bruce Betty, and Gavin Robb on a phone call last Friday, any of them in town council can inter interrupt me at any time to correct or comment on what I said and to add another point. I will then allow the sheet safety engineer to make a statement. Council will be able to question the expert, then I will open the, everything to the public for their comments on, on what happened. Specifically, Sheets is proposing to amend the conditional use criteria for service stations to permit up to two service stations in the RC residential commercial district to be located within 1,500 feet of each other only when the stations are located at the same signalized intersection. Currently, section 1328.11b1 of the zoning code requires that the location of a gas station must be 15 feet minimum from each other. The reason for this amendment as stated in the third paragraph of the whereas clause of the tentative ordinance number 1477 is to encourage the clustering of service stations at signalized intersections which will improve traffic safety. There were 21 people who appeared before council on this amendment. Six people sp spoke in favor of the amendment. 15 spoke against the amendment. Not one resident of Montclair or Casa Grande spoke in favor of this amendment, nor has any resident of Montclair or Casa Grande uh, con contacted me to indicate they were in favor of this amendment. In the interest of full disclosure, I have had four residents of McCandless email me to say they were in favor of the new sheets location. I have also had two residents of Casa Grande email me stating they were not in favor of the new sheets location. None of these people spoke at the public hearing to give testimony. Since sheets has the burden of proving the amendment will do what it is alleged to it will do, namely improve traffic safety. I would like to summarize what each of the proponents of the amendment stated. I'm going to limit my analysis to four people of the six people who favor cheats. Uh, first was attorney Ryan Wotus, attorney Joseph Mystic, Sheets' expert witness, Todd Roll of, Mr. Todd Roll of A Comfort on Perry Highway, a resident of Franklin Park, Ralph the Don, former police chief and former town councilman. There were two others who spoke highly of Sheets, but one of them said he would probably feel differently if he were a resident of Montclair. Both of the people live west of the current Sheets and therefore are not downwind of the westerly winds and both live in an area not as close as Montclair is to the new Sheets. Attorney Ryan Wotus did not give any evidence or testify that the current amendment, if passed, would result in improved traffic safety, nor did he testify that there was a current traffic safety issue. Based on his testimony at the April 9, 2018 zoning committee meeting, where he said in answer to Council President Kim Zachary's question, why do you want this change? His response was that he received a letter from the landowner at the current Sheets location that the existing landowner wanted to ensure they could retain the right to operate a gas station. Health, safety, and welfare were not mentioned. Then at the April 23rd, 2018 business meeting of town council, attorney Wotus stated that our concern for meeting that 1,500 foot criteria is a reason for the change. The next person on the, uh, list that were, was a proponent for the change was Joseph Mystic, she's his expert witness for sheets. Uh, he claimed expertise regarding spacing requirements. He felt that spacing requirements were anti-competitive and created a, a monopoly. He did not say there was a safety issue now or that adopting the text amendment would improve traffic safety. He said, in effect, 
the issue is one of the general welfare of the community versus the citizens, pres presumably the affected residents of Montclair and Cassie Grande. Mr. Tr Todd Roll of A Comfort on Perry Highway, who will be sharing a driveway with the new sheets, pointed out that there is a dead care near the old sheets and that children have to get on a school bus, approximately two dozen kids. I personally am fair, uh, favor, familiar with the daycare location since my wife and I often drop, drop off early in the morning a seamstress who works at Lynn's Taylor Shop, which is located near the daycare center. The seamstress says the children board the bus at approximately 8.45 a.m. and get off the bus in the, in the afternoon at the daycare's driveway in Old Perry Highway on the same side of the street as the daycare. Sheets is across Old Perry Highway. Employees of the daycare accompany the children both when they get on in the morning and when they get off in the afternoon. The fourth person to present something for in, um, information or testimony in favor of the uh, Sheets Amendment was Ralph LaDawn, former police chief and former town councilman. He spoke in favor of Sheets, compared citizens' reaction to the same reaction that occurred when McIntyre Center was being proposed. People claiming their land values would be adversely affected. The McIntyre Center is primary, primarily in Ross Township. No gas station was involved. In fact, the McIntyre Center in McCandless is a C4 regional shopping center district, which does not allow gas stations. McIntyre Center was developed in 1986 or thereabouts. My recollection is that a Kaufman store already existed, as did a tire company on the McCandless side of McIntyre Center. According to a Google search, Kaufman opened the store in April of 1966. I don't believe there is any comparison between what happened at McIntyre Center and Cheats and what Cheats is planning for with uh, at Montclair with a new Cheats project, at least partially in the Montclair neighborhood. The testimony of Jason Moots of Montclair supports this conclusion. Jason Moots is a real estate agent and a resident of Montclair. Mr. Moots' testimony is the first uh, person's testimony I would like to discuss, which is against the Sheets proposal. Sheets, Jason pointed out many reasons and documented them to show that having a Sheets location that included a convenience store, at least partially on Montclair, would adversely affect the real estate values of Montclair and other homes on, uh, on other streets. Note that according to the presentation given before the Planning Commission on January 3rd, 2018, the convenience store, which, which will be at least in part located at 131 Montclair, will be 4,700 square feet, have indoor seating for 30, have outdoor seating, and a dumpster. Jason Moots handed out a folder that included the Sheets location in other municipalities that were not in residential areas with the residential homes with residential homes near the Sheets service station. There were no residential homes near any of these uh, Sheets. The list shows 11 Sheets location. I'm familiar with four of them. The two in o Ohio Township on Montnevo Road, uh, one at the exit of 79, it's Montnevo and 79. As you get off the uh, turnpike, you'll notice it there. And the other near, near Montnevo Point Shopping Center, which is uh, down further near uh, Camp Horn Road, but at, at the Walmart, uh, 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 well, not in Walmart, but, but at, at the end of the shopping center. The sheets in Ross Township on Babcock Boulevard near Cemetery Lane, the one in Wexford at 910 and Nicholson Road. There are no res residential homes near any of these. I brought this fact that there is no residential homes. Uh, I brought this fact that no residential homes were near these sheets locations before in time, the planning commission on meeting on July 3rd, 
2018. And I don't know, was this, this was not on their agenda. We were just shooting the breeze before we started the meeting. And someone said that, at, that the current sheets on Perry Highway and Old Perry Highway, that there are some residential homes nearby. But the current sheets location on Old Perry Highway has a long history of gas stations, presumably which started before any of the current, current residents bought their homes. On the other hand, Montclair has no history of gas stations or convenience stores. And in fact, according to the Allegheny Tax Assessment website, 131 Montclair has had a residence on it since 1910. The site itself is listed as residential and has been taxed as residential for real estate tax purposes. I'm sure that the selling price the current owner is getting from Sheets is much higher than the price they would get for a residence they could not change into a commercial site. The people on Montclair, when they purchased their residence, I'm sure they had no idea they would have a convenience store or any kind of commercial development at 131 Montclair. In addition, Mr. Motz's folder included data on FHA financing. The FHA guidelines mentioned that property within 300 feet of a stationary storage tank containing 1,000 gallons of flammable or explosive material is ineligible in, that's ineligible for FHA financing. He also testified as to the Fannie Mae guidelines, which state an appraiser must consider present or anticipate use of any adjoining property that may adversely affect the value or markability of the subject property. Mr. Moots produced a list of properties on Montclair, Casa Grande, Terra Place, and Fairview Avenue East, properties whose financing could be impacted by the Sheets Venture. Mr. Moose also supplied the current disclosure statement. That is a statement the seller has to give the buyer uh, to potential buyers. Uh, page nine, paragraph nine of page three addresses water supply. Some homes on Montclair have uh, wells. Paragraph 18, page seven addresses hazardous substances and environmental issues. And par paragraph 20, page 8, discloses any information that may affect value. The next person to uh, speak, the next person I have outlined as a speaking against the Sheets proposal was Michael Gronsky of 131, 136 Montclair. He said that the real reason Sheets is proposing the text amendment is to avoid litigation with the current landowner who owns the property the Sheets is on and not for safety issues. He handed out a sheet from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation that shows there are minimal accidents at the, in the Sheets area, which includes Gloria Street, Montclair, and Old Perry Highway and Perry Highway at Sheets. The handout showed 16 accidents over a three-year period, January 1st, 2015 to December 31st, 2017. I have looked at our traffic reports for 2018 and found two accidents, one at Gloria and one at Montclair. There were no injuries involved in that accident. This is for the six month period ending June 30th, 2018. Interestingly, Covenant Avenue, a street in McCandless Crossing East, shows three accidents in June of 2018. And you'll see that accident report, it should be included in, in your current uh, package. In addition, he pointed out various sections of McKenna's zoning code, including section 1328.01, whose purpose it, of, of a residential commercial district where the development must be in harmony, it has to be in harmony with the residential character of the neighborhood, especially the east side of Perry Highway, which would include Mont Montclair and Casa Grande. The final person I'll, I'll, I'll uh, outline their, their testimony is that Linda Hamilton of 212 Montclair. She said that going from an old, the current sheets location with six pump, pumps for gas to the proposed lease sheets location located across the street with 10 pumps for gas and diesel would increase the traffic to sheets from 1,800 to 3,000 trips per day. And increasing the pumps plus increasing the size of the convenience store Again, according to the minutes of the Planning Commission of January 3rd, 2018, the new store will be 4,700 square, 
square feet and have inside seating for 30 plus outside seating and those factors will increase the traffic traffic for sheets i've been told sheets followed a traffic study showing 3200 trips per year per day per day 3200 trips per day Miss, mrs hamilton further stated there are four traffic cycles currently that work well with the traffic lights the only trouble is getting out of montclair their neighborhood but they have lived it, lived with it for many years and can continue to live with it she said the pr project increases to five traffic light cycles and will even further slow down traffic she compared it to the swickley oakmont intersection delay other residents of montclair casa grande and prescott pointed out lighting issues 24 7 safety issues with respect to the new sheets benzine issues the old sheets becoming a blight and, po and possible landslide issues question the the zoning of 131 montclair is being zoned in a c3 district which is commercial highway that requires it to be on an arterial road or collector road montclair is a street with 17 houses on it that ends in a dead end there's no way a, Mont a arterial road such as perry highway or mcknight road or a collector road such as perrymont or grubs montclair residents don't want to turn right into the new sheets and then left at the traffic light to get on perry perry highway south bound they cited the amount of traffic in the parking lot and the customers of sheets they would have to deal with pointed out that there is no right of way to enter for the sheets to use the light uh, uh, light traffic light at sheets and therefore uh those are the, my that my comments uh do you want are there any comments by castle mr chairman I, I do have some questions uh regarding the sheets but if i'm not sure how would you like to uh proceed with with that well go ahead that's process i mean you raised, oh, you raised the number of issues yeah and i, I, I oh, certainly for, want some answers to those as well well are you asking me or will you want to yeah. i would like to address well the, uh i i said that the uh traffic safety engineer is we we, we, we agreed that he would make a presentation that's fine Good evening, Ryan Wotus again. Uh, there's a lot to digest from, from that summary that was provided. Um, we do have our traffic safety engineer uh, who's here this evening that's available to speak to the existing conditions, the traffic concerns associated with that, and then ultimately uh, what is uh, proposed to be um, the improvements that are made, proposed to be made to that intersection in that area of uh, Perry Highway. Yeah, this is not public comment. And, and uh, the safety engineer was, has, has been invited so he can give a presentation. Okay. And so we're not putting him on the clock. And the last thing I'd just like to note is, is a lot of the items that um, were indicated that we had not spoken to um, at the last meeting, we didn't have the opportunity to present a lot of individuals that we did have at that time, including uh, en uh, environmental engineers, uh, lighting engineers. Um, civil engineers and including our traffic engineer who will be able to speak this evening uh, to those traffic issues we also do have uh, two individuals here from sheets uh, that can speak specifically to environmental concerns uh, should council have questions uh, related to that there were quite you know items brought up uh, regarding benzene so they are here as well um, came in from altoona to be able to speak to those items that were raised by uh, the community and also council um, with that being said, I'd like to start with uh, Chuck Worcester, who is our traffic uh, engineer for this project. Good evening. My name is Chuck Worcester from David E. Worcester and Associates. 
traffic engineer consultants working with sheets. Um, this is a copy of your existing traffic signal permit for the intersection of Old Perry Highway um, and 19 and Gloria. <clears throat> um, two things to point out, obviously, lack of, of turn lanes. The other thing is that this driveway that exists today actually enters the intersection inside this traffic signal box without any traffic signal control. That cannot happen. You can't get that permitted by the Department of Transportation today. That has to be signalized. It's not. Um, to touch on the accident issue that was touched on by the councilman, 16 traffic accidents in a, in a three-year period. Pennsylvania Department of Transportation defines an accident problem as five or more accidents in a 12-month period of a type susceptible to correction. We've reviewed those accidents, and the majority of the accidents associated with this intersection are associated with a lack of left turn lanes. <clears throat> By clustering um, and locating a, uh, the development within the intersection, let me flip this upside down, it's oriented the same way. you get uh, a better efficiency with the traffic signal control. You signalize this access. We're able to provide this left turn lane shown in red by some uh, widening of Route 19 to provide for a turn lane. This turn lane is actually has, has nothing to do with the sheets, but will provide a turn lane for existing traffic. By shadowing it, we can provide the southbound left turn lane. This will eliminate a significant number of accidents that occur at the intersection um, and additionally signalize this access. In addition, in the old traffic signal control, you have a lack of <coughs> adequate pedestrian crossings. You have called the hand signs. Current criteria call for. The use of pedestrian countdown timers. So you'd have state-of-the-art traffic signal control implemented into the intersection with all approaches being signalized as required by the Department of Transportation. Um, going toward the traffic volumes that were discussed in your narrative, they're double what, um, what actually does occur because you don't take trip generation to pumps and, and Cumulative, cumulatively add them to the trip generation to, to, a, to the store. It's one or the other, the highest of both. Um, so that number is significantly overstated. So those talk to the specific safety concerns of this intersection with regard to the signal. I was told to limit my comments to that. If there's any questions or comments, I'd be glad to address them. What could, if we were to use this, this set up as, a, as the traffic, as the, as the intersection, what could be done to prevent the cars from blocking the, the Montclair exit? Is there a possible tandem light or is there some sort of street markings that keep cars from blocking the full intersection? We had a video that we'd like to have shown. We understand we can't do that. I will offer that it can be viewed at any time. The traffic program that we used that was reviewed by your traffic consultant by PennDOT is called Synchro. It's a traffic signal uh, coordination optimization program and it simulates so that we can determine its operational characteristics. It also has a program called Sim Traffic that actually simulates the look of the traffic on there. So I've provided you with that. Um, essentially, this lane, because there's only one lane, queues well beyond Montclair because this becomes what we call a de facto left turn lane. So the center lane becomes a de facto left turn lane because there's so many people that want to turn left. There's some merging that happens ahead of it. Through traffic goes in one lane, left turn traffic stays in the other lane. By providing that, and it queues up well beyond Montclair. If you can see the video of the operation of the intersection, because you're providing a left turn lane, you now have two lanes that can continue north and you do not experience the same queuing that you have back to Montclair. 
So Montclair will not be blocked the same way that it is today. Can you explain where you said something about a crosswalk? And I'm concerned with the students from CCAC right. and anyone who wants to cross 19, which is a very busy road. Where would the crosswalk be? Crosswalks are essentially where they are today. From a technical standpoint, you have crosswalk across on the north side of the intersection, across Old Perry, across Gloria, and across um, uh, the southern portion of, of Old 19. They would be retained. We're actually adding a crosswalk because we're adding a driveway. Um, there's, no, there's no crosswalk across this existing driveway today. We would be adding one along the sidewalks to make that safer. But the, the primary change is the, is the traffic signal indication. Um, going from just the hand sign that stops, uh, there's a great deal of confusion with pedestrian crossings on how they function because a lot of people don't know how long that yellow flashing don't walk, what that's meant to do. Uh, state of the art traffic signal heads have been gone to a countdown timer, so it literally shows you how much time you have before it's going to stop. And so it counts down 15, 14, 13. So it's a lot cleaner, a lot more understood and intuitive for pedestrians to understand. So that's the significant improvement there. One other point, there was an issue with adding a, a phase to the traffic signal. Clearly, when you add left turns, you're going to add an exclusive left turn phase, what we call protected permissive or protected permissive phasing. It's where you have an arrow, and then it'll go to a green ball. You can continue. That does add a phase. However, even with adding that phase, the operational efficiency of adding the traffic, or the left turn lanes, which are a significant safety improvement, far outweigh and don't have any significant impact by adding that left, the, the, the advanced phase, the existing, or the additional advanced phase. Question well, here. I'm sorry. Was that, yeah. Did that go? No, yeah, here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do the contemplated traffic signals make sure I can be heard here. Do the contemplated uh, traffic signals include uh, a handicap provision, such as for a person, for example, a deaf person crossing the road, do they have I've seen those, I think they have it done in the city of Pittsburgh and elsewhere. Is there any provision for that sort of issue? They can always be added. Those are, are done by request only. So if you have visually impaired or if you have hearing impaired, uh, with, hearing, uh, with he hearing impaired, um, there, are, there are ways that, that can be done, but basically they still have the visual. It's the visually impaired where you get um, sometimes chirps up in the city of Butler, you'll hear that they have a bell that goes off, things like that. You can also go to what's called an exclusive pedestrian phase that adds an exclusive phase just for pedestrians to move. It always comes at the impact of traffic capacity, but it's, a, it's the highest level of safety you're going to get for pedestrian crossings. Those would be done by request. Part of my motivation for asking that, that question, and I'll be real brief, was the fact that there'll be so many students uh, in the general area wondered whether that would impact or be likely to increase the need for that kind of a feature in the traffic signals. When we conduct traffic studies, we identify all of the pedestrian crossings that are there today. So if there are any, it would be included into our study to determine whether um, warrants or criteria are met to establish certain pedestrian crossings. Um, it's difficult at this point to anticipate what kind of foot traffic you're going to get to this location, but that can, that can be obviously analyzed and, and mitigated with this type of traffic signal control. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wooster, uh, currently the zoning code requires that a gas station be 1,500 feet minimum from the another gas station in the RC residential commercial district. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is a gas station where their current sheets is located, will it increase t traffic safety to allow a gas station across the street? Or is, will that, or you're not saying that, that that's going to happen, that, that increasing, uh, allowing a, tra a, uh, a gas station to be across the street increases safety? The, the development of this property would, would provide for the widening of this, this yeah, road. That goes to the project itself, not the text amendment. I'm but saying the, that the text the, amendment the, has to be, is, uh, is, is to supposed to be for to improve safety. Correct. By, by, by allowing the proper use and the efficiency of a traffic signal control 
for uses that don't generate a lot of new traffic. The idea that these things generate all new traffic is not accurate. The majority of the traffic generated by convenience stores are already on the road. It's a convenience item. They pull in and they do generate traffic or driveway volume. So the fact that it's generating driveway volume would require, even though this thing's been warranted for years and years, because it'd be paid for privately, it, it affords the opportunity to allow them to make that significant safety improvement as well as develop the property. Well, it's, it's the things you're, you're proposing to do that will allow it, not the 1,500, change in the 1,500 foot requirement. That is to, I don't want to say I have less to do with the text amendment. Yeah. I can say that the clustering, uh, I would agree wholeheartedly uh, uh, with, uh, sorry, I lost my, Mr. Mystic. with Joe Mystic, that, that taking the efficiency of those uses at a traffic signal is the most appropriate for traffic safety. Chuck, Absolutely. Chuck, can you speak to the difference though, between putting this use at a signalized intersection rather than mid-block where currently we would be permitted if we were 1,500 feet away? So this it, use could be mid-block at an unsignalized inter intersection. Correct. Would this, this, by putting it at a signalized intersection, this use creates a safer atmosphere from the public traffic standpoint and, and operation? With, without question. Without well, question. Well, so the accommodation of the accommodation of that level of driveway volumes mid block without traffic signal control could be a problem. Well, Perrymont is another signalized station. Couldn't you just then put the uh, and it's more than fifteen hundred feet from uh, the current sheet. Couldn't you just put a station there? Uh, you're asking a traffic engineer about placing sta well, you're, stations. You're, yeah, but I mean you're saying within a fifteen hundred feet it, it increases safety having two stations across? Absolutely. Whereas, whereas having uh, one station. Uh, I, th I think the critical language is at a traffic, at a signalized intersection, allowing them within a signalized intersection. You're taking advantage of the fact that a traffic signal assigns time. People don't opt to create their own time. It assigns time for all movements. It is much safer to accommodate traffic on approaches at a traffic signal than it is mid block. Well, are, are you aware that at the, uh, the January 3rd uh, meeting before the Planning Commission, that uh, someone from your office, so, according to the minutes, someone has said uh, there, this will be the only gas station, your, your gas station will be the only gas station in the RC zone district. district. There, there was never any contemplation about a second station. That, that was related to a prior application. That, that was not related to. To what's so you're saying there'll be more than one gas station in an RC district? Well, there there currently is more than one based on what, what you just stated that there's one in Perrymont, I believe. No, there no. isn't. No, there isn't one in Perrymont. No. She's asking why it wouldn't be safe. Why it couldn't be at Perrymont? Well, I was asking why it could not be at Perrymont. There is only one station in the RC district. Okay. So what what you were referring to, though, I believe, was related to a prior application that had been pending that was withdrawn, and at that at that point it had been indicated that there would be one station once this was redeveloped at this intersection. So it's not relevant necessarily for the tech. What, what is currently pending before you is, is separate. Uh, did you, uh, Mr. Brewster, did you do any, uh, check any police reports for uh, to see if there is a traffic safety uh, uh, problem? Yes, we're required by state criteria to submit. And in fact, we submitted a, a separately bound report to both the township and to um, PennDOT um, that that identifies all of the accidents within that area to determine whether there whether there is indeed an accident problem or not. <clears throat> and I said that we're in 2018. I said there were two accidents mm -hmm. at one at Gloria and one at uh, Mont Montclair. Were, were there more than two? Or are you telling me there was more than two? Our traffic study was done last year. We don't have 2018 data in there. So you have half of 2018 data, and I don't know where you got it. We get it from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. Yeah, but you, you would agree that two, for that location, uh, for uh, Montclair, uh, Gloria, the old Perry Highway and Perry Highway, uh, two, two is pretty good. Two for six months is pretty good, wouldn't you? Would I agree to that? Yeah, would you? No, I'd like it to be zero. 
So if I look at those accidents and they're, and they're associated purely with left turns, then well, I would you say... Know, how do you know they were pre, pre, uh, purely associated I said, with if, left turns? I said oh, if really? they are. Okay. I said if. The ones that we reviewed, 15 accidents. In our opinion, 10 of the 15 accidents all associated with the lack of left turn lanes. Well, they have a left turn. Well, not a left turn thing. They have a left turn arrow. That's not a left turn lane. I know. Correct. We're well, saying yeah, that were, in our, were, my were professional any opinion. Actions, were any of the accidents you're aware of uh, occurred because of left turns? Yes. So th there were? Yes. Which ones? <laughs> 10 of 15. Angle accidents from 20, that included 2017 data because our stuff was done before. It was done in 2016. Angle accidents involving northbound left turning vehicles and southbound motors traveling straight. There were five. There was an angle of accident involving a southbound left turning vehicle and northbound motors traveling straight. So same type of accident. There was a rear end collisions in the, in the left, northbound left turn lanes. Those are caused by all of that merging back and forth. And rear end collision, wait, northbound right turn. Was this in 2017? No, those were in the, in the data that we have for all of the years. I didn't pull For all of the years? For the years that we analyzed, correct. Which, which years are they? The five years preceding 2016. And then we added 2017 data. There's but when two thirds of your accidents have a causation factor that is clearly identifiable, there's an issue. And we're proposing to mitigate that issue. The reason you, oh, if I may, if, if uh, the reason you consider a certain number of years, mm -hmm. is that because of, uh, is that something you thought of or is that something that PennDOT requires? PennDOT requires it. <coughs> and that's done at a scoping meeting that was attended by the township there. It's all agreed to prior to the start of the work. And it's a requirement of the department. When you told us that you're going to add a lane, can you tell us where it would start where you're adding the lane? How far back on 19? widening starts here, which would be two properties south. So the property of Montclair, this would be the AMCO transmission place, one property south of that, um, and extend up north to into property of the, the Allegheny County uh, College, the community college. It would go past community college. It's, it's approximately, college, I want to say it's approximately a thousand, yeah. right. a thousand feet. Line. Yes, okay. correct. It requires right-of-way dedication by the property owner, um, but the rest of it can be done within the existing rights-of-way. Okay. And the other way probably go to Pizza Rama, right? Was that Pizza Rama and Rama this Rama lane, right, this way. And, mm -hmm. and, and this lane will still not be as long as it, as it should be but we only have control of so much property. Um, so it, but the Department of Transportation has accepted what we could provide them, saying anything is better than not having one. Does that mean for the existing situation or the existing situation plus the proposed sheets? Correct, because remember, our which traffic is not turning left. Which one was correct? I, kind of, I asked you kind of a... For the existing... For the existing situation and with the proposed sheets, because the northbound left turn has nothing to do with sheets. It's going away from the site. We're not generating additional traffic volume into the northbound left turn lane. That's what's needed today. We're pre putting one for the southbound left turn to accommodate the sheets. The northbound left turn is required, is warranted, it's probably been warranted for 15, 20 years. What amount of traffic do you believe is going to enter the mouth of Montclair to get to the Montclair exit or entrance to the Sheets parking lot? And is that an, even a necessary entrance to the Sheets parking lot? It, it is, it's, I would say that it's necessary because it provides options, um, particularly for the Montclair residents. I've heard testimony saying that, you know, driving into the sheets will cause all kind of conflict. I have all my years of working uh, with sheets as well as other convenience stores have not had to investigate 
traffic accidents within within the, the centers. They have traffic that it's going through any other parking field. So it provides them an option. Um, by by allowing that, it, it again it reduces the burden on that. And to have somebody wait in this line for a traffic signal to come in, uh, its destination is here primarily to the to the you know the first line of sight is to the fuel canopy. That's a, a simple turn into the fuel canopy. That's actually I believe in advance of where the driveway is for uh, the Amco. Is. Chuck, can you talk about level of service in Montclair and what the improvements will do to the level of service at Montclair? The level of service at Montclair is likely not going to change much um, because. What, but what will happen that's significant is the reduction in the, in the northbound queues, which right now prohibit people from being able to pull out of Montclair because people who want to turn left are, and that are going through are all stuck in the same lane going northbound. And it queues regularly past Montclair. So if, if, the, if, the, driveway, if, the, if the driveway not at the signalized intersection if the entrance to the parking lot was 40 feet farther towards the signalized intersection and just went in directly into the parking lot of the sheets instead of through Montclair, what are we talking? You know, two car lengths. Uh, I don't. Um, are you saying to take this what driveway? What if we were to eliminate down? the entrance to, to Montclair, the, 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 the parking entrance on Montclair, and just push it down 40 feet so that it was? you enter directly into the sheet site. The Department of Transportation wouldn't, per would, wouldn't permit that. You talk about putting one down here? Right. No, they wouldn't permit it. Hmm. Okay. For what reason? That's okay. proximity to Montclair. Who asked that question? <clears throat> ask Council's turn. Please. Mr. Wooster? Yes, sir. Did, did, did you look at the traffic counts on Route 19 currently, what daily trips on Route 19 past the sheets. What kind of traffic volumes are we talking about on 19? How many people traverse that road every day past sheets? The know, use of uh, 19 like, yeah. completely. Yeah. Exactly. You're asking in a, in a day or in an hour? I think a day's the easiest. I'm not an engineer, so. Well, I, the reason I say that is because <laughs> yeah. traffic engineers don't analyze daily traffic. We analyze hourly traffic. And actually, when you boil it down, you're actually analyzing a 15 minute period. Okay. That's why we study the morning, e morning rush hour and evening rush hour. So when we count, we generally focus only on peak hours. When you collect traffic volumes with the hoses, you're generally determining whether you meet a traffic signal warrant because you have to get eight hours to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times we're required to collect average daily traffic volumes and then we don't use them. It's, it costs my client money, it costs us time, and we don't use them. So, but generally the traffic volumes on a arterial highway like this during the PM peak hour represent approximately eight to 10% of the daily traffic. Okay. So, let's see if I can pull up the counts. It's easiest to do from the figures. Apologize. So, in the. Were you required to collect these? In other words, did you do some type of a survey with the, the, the trip? Yes. Trip picks? You did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we manually count it. Um, and a lot of times we use um, technology called MyoVision. It's, it's done by video camera, and then it's sent away for, for reduction. Um, in the PM peak hour, there is approximately 900 cars going northbound and approximately 600 500 and some coming southbound, so 1,500, so you probably have 15 to 20,000 cars, cars a day. A day. Correct. Okay. And PM peak is five to six? Is it? Uh, it, it, it is the highest, we analyzed the highest hour, it just counted happened to 15 be, minute yeah, periods between four and six, so it could be 445 to 545, 415 to 515. 
it is what it ends up being. Question here, please. If excuse me, I'd like to follow on. May I please? If we if the if the ordinance change is made to permit two stations at a signalized intersection, how will that increase, or what to what level do you anticipate increasing those those PNP traffic counts? On it, the highway. It, it wouldn't be significant because again 60 to 80 percent of the traffic right now that goes to a sheets or a get-go or a speedway or all of those is already on the road rarely does anybody sit and say I'm going to leave my house or my whatever go to sheets and come back to to do whatever they're doing it's not a primary trip maker uh, like a doctor's office would be or like a number of things would be they're, they're called, they're high pass by trip generators, which means the traffic's already on the road. You're creating driveway volume because it has to divert in, come back out. So it would not be significant. So in if my I opinion. may, then when we talk about congestion, we're not, we're not talking about additional vehicles, but we're talking about congestion caused by the turning in and out of the uh, establishment. Correct. And, in, and with an unsignalized access, that would be more difficult. With a signalized access, it, it's more efficient and much safer, which is why in the previous, this, this driveway, which is in the middle of a signalized intersection, is not signalized. So it has to be signalized. It should be now and, and would be if, if you kept the exact same uses today and went to PennDOT and say, I want to permit that driveway, they'd make you signalize it. I actually pulled into there at 12 o'clock at night, and I still had to wait for three cars before I could pull back out of that driveway. Uh, as I pulled up, I'm like, I can't believe this isn't signalized. It, it, Which I didn't again, it's, until it's, this it's unusual, week. but um, the only thing that we're not required to signalize now would be a single family residential driveway. Yeah. Mr. McKinney, one more? Uh, if I may, so you, you made reference to Ms. Hamilton's comments from the, the last public hearing. She brought up, I think, very, <coughs> very, very well the, the issue of five cycles versus four cycles on mm -hmm. the lights. You touched on it, but you really haven't completely assuaged my concerns for that, um, particularly if the pedestrian crossings are required to be, if, if we ask for, what was it called, proprietary pedestrian Exclusive crossing. pedestrian Exclusive. phase? Yeah. Yes. So have you done the studies, can you tell me exactly how this will improve the, the flow of traffic with the with all the additional yeah, turns? I'm understanding now that there yeah. are now that I understand right. the congestion issue. It's 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 all it's it's all in the report which has been put onto the video. You can you can see it operate better. That's the easiest way for for someone not in the you know Mr. Getz from Trans reviewed this. He understands it because it's his language, and he and I speak that same language. For people to be able to see it operate, it's better to watch it in a simulation and to watch the level of queuing, what you have, what you don't have. Much of certain queues stay the same. This queue would stay the same. You would think by adding an extra phase that these queues would get longer, and they don't because you're getting a more efficient operation. So essentially what happens is there is, there is more time being given to, the, to attempt this left turn than should be there because maybe three cars want to turn left and then two cars want to go straight and so you don't have everybody in that lane that wants to turn left. You have some. So you don't have efficient operation there. So you might get in one cycle with the left turn arrow, you might get four left turns to go through and a bunch of through movements or you might get ten. Whereas if you have an exclusive lane of that length, you can get 10 or 15 through each cycle with that. So you get a much more efficient operation when you provide for an auxiliary left turn lane and the left turn phasing. Mr. Wooster, can you give me a, a, a back of the envelope percentage of improvement that you, you think is, will be attained with this resignalization? Is this a 10% improvement, a 15%? No, I, I, I actually can't. That's That's... It's, it's not that simple. It's not that cut and dry. It is, it is because you're, you, you can't, you can, so we have delay. During the peak. You have, you the have peak. delay, but then you have safety. So you're asking me to, to quantify a safety improvement that can't be quantified. 
I can tell you that we will reduce accidents by the, by the installation of the turn lane. Mm -hmm. Delay will be no significantly worse because remember, we're not allowed by the department to make it worse. In the PM peak hour, it doesn't get worse. So we're not making delays go up, but we're improving safety significantly. Uh, you misunderstood my question. I, I, I was referring to the flow, the free flow of traffic. In other words, the, the, right. the number of vehicles passing through the intersection, the improvement in the time required to move traffic through there, for instance, during a peak period with the re-signalized intersection versus, versus the current situation where you have delays due to the left turning, stacking, and that sort of thing. Right. Well, again, you're asking for a delay comparison. The delays are not going to, we, we're not permitted by the department to increase delays through the intersection more than 10 seconds per vehicle or we'd be required to mitigate further. So this mitigation satisfies those requirements. Okay. Then, then I'd like to refer back to, to Mr. Wiskoskis's question earlier again, which I, I, it wasn't entirely clear to me your response. If there are two stations at a signalized intersection, mm -hmm which is what we are proposing in this amendment, um, and we have a re-signalized intersection, is the condition there at the end of the day better or worse than it is today? Significantly better with the inclusion of the turn lanes. Significantly better. Even without knowing the percentage of you're, improvement? You're asking, you're asking a, a traffic engineer. Yes, I've sir. been doing this for 35 years as mm -hmm. a professional. You, I'm comparing two things. So we have levels of service. We could talk about delay all we want. This is delay and improvement in safety, which is part of the reason we're doing this, is because the Department of Transportation won't allow this property to develop like this unless this level of improvement is done. It's required today. Nobody can afford it. So this development has to foot the bill for that wide. But it's a significant safety improvement. Thank you. Can you help me understand if I'm coming out of Highland Road, the sheets that would be on my left. Mm -hmm. Now the new sheets is going to be over here. How am I getting from Highland Road if I wanted to go to the new sheets? Let's say that it's there. Mm -hmm. Left turn. Do I? Are you going to have a complete turn there, left? There's no additional lane here. You would come out with that phase. That phase comes out on its own today, correct? It's an exclusive phase. You have no opposition. You would have, you have an option to make a hard left turn. You have an option to make a right hand turn. Or today, you could drive across that and go into the existing driveway. So your approach doesn't change a lick. I mean, rarely do you see anyone come out of Highland Road and. Correct. It doesn't have a high demand because it goes the other way. Right. It's primarily a right turn. The predominant movement here is a left turn and a right turn back out as far as Highland is concerned, which is why this left turn lane has been warranted for years. Well, Mr. Wooster, uh, the convenience store will have seating for 30 and out, outside seating. Uh, don't you feel that will uh, attract customers that are not getting get, going to get gas, that just want to get uh, a coffee or a sandwich? Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess sure I'm back from Philadelphia, and uh, I noticed that that's what we do for at Wawa's. And Wawa's is similar to Sheets. Uh, and uh, I, I feel that the convenience store attracts the uh, uh, attracts people who, who, who do not get gas. It certainly can. It attracts people that simply have to go to the bathroom. So it, it attracts all types. All of the volumes that we have regarding the attraction to the site have been included in the traffic study. Regardless of what their purpose is at the site, they're included in the traffic site. And that, did you anticipate that, uh, that move uh, that uh, customer uh, want in your traffic site? Sure. I just said we used all of the generation of this store, regardless of the purpose, all of the generation for this convenience store has been included in the traffic study. And you came up with less than 3000 That's correct. How many did you come up with?
1,628, 814 in, 814L. And what is it currently? That's per day, 628 per day? 1,628. 1,628. Yeah, yeah, I said 1,628. Well, yeah. um, it's, uh, w with the size of the store, I believe uh, it was approximately 30 some percent less. 30 some percent less. I may be incorrect on that, so I, I'd have to. We, we actually counted that car or that, that store to actually identify the exact volume. The existing trip generation we have by hour, the existing generation in the morning peak hour is 219 total, um, 198 in the PM, and 225 on a Saturday. And then we have those broken, broken down also into primary and pass by trips based on national study. And again, the majority of traffic in each of those peak hours is already on the road and is not new to the road. And that number has been identified as being right now ultra conservative because recent studies have shown that trip generation associated with convenience stores that better than 80% is already on the road. But we're required by the Department of Transportation to use Institute of Transportation Engineers data currently. Until it's updated. So you're saying these the, this not, these numbers are high as opposed to low? Correct. They're they're, they're more conservative. That's okay. correct. As far as the pass by trip na trip numbers. So we're actually superimposing more traffic onto the road than it will likely occur as new. I only remember doing it once. Do you have any, any other? Are there any other questions? questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bush. You're welcome. Uh, I'm, I'll now open it to the public if any. Well, well, I think he has one more. I, think oh, okay. I, I didn't realize they were going to. Uh, oh, well, they, they brought in some environmental amounts in, and I think they wanted to address okay. some of the comments okay. that have been made. I'm just trying to squeeze in a question before. It's very brief. And it's been some time ago. We may, I, I forgot, but there was, this, there was a comment made. I don't remember who made it, that PennDOT would not allow the establishment of something moving, moving it up, up the road a bit. Do you remember what that was? And I was wondering what that, that was a public comment or that, that had come from, from the sheets? Yeah, so one, one of the gentlemen consults. here said PennDOT, uh, the gentleman just spoke, said PennDOT would not permit yeah. that. And I was the, wondering. The question was specifically whether we could move this driveway up Montclair toward the intersection or stick it right next to Montclair yeah, I know you. on 19. And the answer is no, it's proximity is too close. Uh, you turned away, I didn't hear what you said. I'm no, sorry. the proximity is too close. Proximity is too close. Uh, under, under some rule or analysis by Pendo. That's correct. Okay. By Pendo's criteria under Chapter 441 of the Pennsylvania Code. Thank you. Uh, as I'd indicated as well, uh, I'd also like to call Matt Cutshaw, uh, who is with Sheets Incorporated, to uh, discuss. Uh, some of the environmental uh, comments that had been raised during the public hearing uh, on some uh, data that is um, a little outdated in comparison to the safety issues or safety uh, systems that are currently in place and utilized by Sheets itself. So, Matt, if you could speak to, sure. um, well, introduce yourself and then go ahead sure. and speak toward vapor recovery and uh, the benzene issues. Sure. Um, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, again, my name is Matt Cutshaw. I'm an environmental compliance manager with Sheets Incorporated. Uh, my purpose tonight was to address some of the previous comments regarding um, a, a benzene cloud uh, around stores and, and how our tanks operate and the possible impacts of vapors. Um, so I wanted to take a, a couple minutes and explain how an underground storage tank system works. Uh, there really isn't a possibility for a benzene cloud or any other cloud uh, to emanate from whether it's a Sheets facility or a Wawa or a Sunoco facility. Um, an underground storage tank operates under a negative pressure. Um, so if you picture a, a sealed vapor tight container that has liquid in it, as liquid is placed back in that tank, such as when a delivery of fuel is made, vapor must go somewhere. Um, both state and federal requirements require what's called stage one vapor recovery. So when a delivery of product is made into those gasoline tanks, that vapor 
comes out of a fitting on the tank and is put back into the transport truck, that vapor is taken back to the terminal where we get our fuel from. Um, common mis misconception is when fuel is placed into a tank, the vapor that needs to come out just goes into the atmosphere. That is not correct. Um, if you ever notice a fuel drop, you'll see two hoses coming from a delivery trailer. One is placing the fuel into the tank. The second hose is the vapor coming out of the tank that goes back into that truck upon, upon delivery of fuel. Uh, there is a scenario where vapor needs to get into that tank in order for the tank to breathe. Uh, as consumers purchase gasoline and it's dispensed into your vehicle, liquid in the form of gasoline comes out of that tank, so vapor needs to come in. The vapor recovery system associated with a tank has, and, and everyone has seen them either on top of canopies or on a stand near where the tanks are, um, as that becomes more and more negatively pressurized as, as fuel leaves that tank, vapor from the atmosphere comes in to equalize the pressure in that tank. It's through what we call a pressure vacuum vent cap uh, on top of that system. So air may come into that tank as fuel is dispensed. However, when fuel is going into that tank on a delivery, all that vapor from that tank is recovered in the, in the delivery truck that delivers the petroleum. I wanted to make sure that that process was clear. Is there any questions specifically on that? Did you sign in by chance? Do we have we're just a spelling of your name? Sure. I, my last name is Cutshall, C as in cat, U-T-S-H-A-L-L. Thanks. You're welcome. Matt, can you also talk about vapor recovery when fueling in the actual vehicle itself? Yeah. Um, prior to a couple years ago, the US EPA in certain areas in the country required what we call stage two vapor recovery. Um, the Pittsburgh area was one of those areas that requires what we call stage two vapor recovery. Um, stage two vapor recovery is the same concept as stage one, like we talked about when you deliver fuel, but it's at your vehicle. When you pull up and purchase gasoline and put in your tank, when you put gasoline in your tank, vapor needs to go somewhere. Uh, the stage two vapor recovery system uh, everyone's used the nozzle. It has the plastic accordion on the end. What that does is when you put fuel into your vehicle, the vapor that comes out of your tank is sucked back into the vapor system and is eventually returned to the gas tanks. That's with stage two vapor recovery. Recently, the EPA has no longer mandated the use of stage two vapor recovery. It's not required to be installed at new stations moving forward. Uh, the rationale for that is as technology is advanced, vehicles now are equipped with what's called onboard vapor recovery systems. Um, as the fuel is put into your vehicle, that vapor is run through a carbon canister that's actually on, as part of your vehicle. And after all the studies that the EPA has done, they've determined that the greater percentage of vehicles on the road are equipped with that technology that stage two vapor recovery is no longer required. Stage two vapor recovery and the onboard vapor recovery system on your car actually work against each other. So that's why the EPA has, has no longer required stage two vapor recovery. I know that's a little bit technical and I apologize. Uh, Mr. Kutcher, what, why is it that uh, sheets with their newer uh, uh, stations don't appear to be building around residential homes? Do you have any idea why that would be? Uh, sir, I am the environmental compliance manager. I would defer your question to someone in our real estate group on, on how and where we choose <laughs> selections of sites. Is there anyone here that could answer from Sheets? We do have somebody that can speak to all the locations in which residential uh, Sheets are developed in residential neighborhoods. So we also can can move on to that briefly. Um, just want to make sure that, that Matt had the opportunity to address any questions uh, that council may have from an environmental standpoint. Are there any, any other questions? Yeah, yes. Okay. May I ask you, is there any chance uh, of any of the tanks affecting the people on Montclair that have wells? There's always a chance of that. However, uh, what I'd like to point out is Sheets currently has, uh, I believe it's either seven or eight service stations, several of which are in this area, uh, in Fleetwood, Newcastle, and Harrisville, where the potable water supply to our retail convenience store is from a drinking water well that is on site immediately beside the UST systems at our stores. It's very common to have a drinking water well on the, on the same site where, where tanks are. Uh, it is 100% permissible through the Pennsylvania DEP. Uh, we have to go through the same permitting process and, and permissions to install drinking water wells at gasoline stations, but it has been approved uh, across the board through the state of Pennsylvania. What were the chances of that water being contaminated be any different when the 
I mean, we're talking about 150 feet between mm -hmm. tanks now. Now the uh, it would all go to the same water supply if it leaked in either. Okay. Um, again, without without trying to get to get real technical, there's there's two two issues that I would I would counter that with. Firstly, the technology of the equipment that is used today for underground storage tank systems and all the associated equipment is light years ahead of stuff that has been out there since the 70s and 80s. All the equipment that Sheets installs today from whether it's tanks, whether it's the product lines, whether it's the containment devices, they're all double wall protected equipment. What that means is for a double wall tank, it's basically a tank inside of another tank. That space between those two tanks is continuously monitored to prevent leaks or to monitor for leaks. Uh, that technology is, again, light years ahead of what, of what most gas stations have. Uh, it's a requirement now to install this type of equipment. Um, the, the chances of having a release from a double wall system are, are incredibly low. They're, they're, every single space that can be monitored in that system is monitored continuously 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and is instantly reported back to, to our corporate facility. Um, just, just, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is your tank, are your tanks made of fiberglass or steel? We have both. Uh, we've used several different manufacturers and several different types of storage tanks. Uh, currently, our specification is a double-walled fiberglass storage tank with a brine-filled interstice. Uh, there's brine liquid in the spaces between the two layers of the tank. That's the tanks that we've, we've selected. Do you ever encase those in cement? Encase them in cement? No. Tanks are store, underground storage tanks are, are not, to my knowledge, ever encased in cement. Um, we've had They're scenarios where out. we've had to place concrete on the bottom of the tank hole because of the geotechnical characteristics of the soil to make sure it's a stable environment to place the tanks. But um, none of the 570 plus sheets facilities have tanks encased in, in concrete. Okay. So what you're saying is the tanks at the new sheets would be safer than those that are in the old sheets? The tanks at the existing sheets facility are single wall fiberglass tanks with single wall fiberglass pipe that was installed in 1984. Uh, the equipment that we use today is substantially safer than, than the technology that's at the existing store because technology has advanced since 1984. Thank you. You're welcome. What kind of plan do you have? It's just in summary and brief. Uh, I'm assuming you have one. Uh, should the remote circumstance uh, occur that you have a leak, what do mm -hmm. you do about it? It depends on, on the type of release that we have. We operate under both state and federal requirements that dictate how we respond and what we have to do to monitor for leaks. Um, as I had said before, every basic piece of that underground storage tank system is monitored by a sensor that is designed to detect the presence of liquid or a change in a level, in a level of liquid. Um, those sensors report back to an operations center in our corporate facility that's manned 24-7, 365. If a sensor ever goes into alarm that's indicative of a release, um, people are automatically dispatched to that. Uh, it's a state requirement that we investigate any of those alarms, as well as a federal requirement. Those alarms are investigated within 24 hours. Uh, Sheets internally handles those calls within a six hour turnaround time. Um, so they all have to be investigated. And 99.x percent of the time, those sensors will detect water uh, water gets into a, uh, a containment device, um, it's, it's typically not fuel. It's either a malfunction of the sensor or rainwater has infiltrated into something and that sensor goes off and, and gives an alarm. They're investigated regardless of what causes them within that time frame that we're required to investigate. Yes, sir. I'm just curious while you're talking about that, this leaking issue. Has a leak ever been detected, a reportable leak of, of any kind? from the Sheets location across the street from the one we're discussing right now? Um, I've been with Sheets for seven years. I don't have any recollection in my seven years of whether there has been a release at that Sheets facility. I can't speak to prior to that, but I'm not aware of any leaks that have occurred or any um, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection remediation projects that may have occurred there. Do you know whether that other station, if I can refer to it in that way, has that more sophisticated uh, 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 devices to, to detect leaks that you described earlier? 
just so I'm clear, are you asking that the new facility that we're planning to build, if that will have that? No, that one I understand will have more sophisticated. The old one? Does the old one have anything similar to that? The old one has some features um, with uh, with the use of single walled tanks and lines at the older facility. Certain monitoring cannot be done because there's not a if there's not a double wall piece of equipment, so you can't monitor a double wall space. Um, the method of release detection that the existing store uses is a process called statistical inventory reconciliation. Um, it basically looks at how much product is delivered and how much is dispensed and does a math equation to look for signs of a release of product. Um, that's a typically a 30 day process. Uh, this new technology again is, is instantaneous. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Cutchin. Yes. Do the current tanks operate under the negative pressure and have the vapor recovery for the benzene as well? All tanks, all of our tanks, as well as anybody else's tanks that are in the state of Pennsylvania are required to have stage one vapor recovery. Yes, stage one vapor recovery is a requirement. Are you ever required to do air sampling or monitoring around the stations to validate that those systems are functioning properly? We don't do air testing around the station. The state of Pennsylvania, as well as all the other states in which we operate, require testing of that stage one vapor recovery system. In Pennsylvania, it's required to be tested every three years, and that Thank testing you. is completed. Thank you. Sure. We've heard multiple times about, and I know you're not the real estate guy, and this doesn't necessarily even, it, it starts with real estate, but doesn't end there. They talk about the, the stationary storage tanks um, being a requirement of Fannie Mae and, and the FHA. They, they, won't, they won't actually make loans to them. But as you pointed out earlier, you, you spoke about underground tanks, which we would all expect. When I looked up the definition of stationary storage tank, it said an above ground tank consisting of 1,000 gallons or more or multiple connected tanks combined. And is, that, is that the actual definition of stationary storage tank or is there a, a reason FHA and Fannie Mae would not put a loan out to a sheets? Uh, uh. I am yeah, I am a, an environmental scientist and geologist. I do not pretend to understand real estate. Well, I guess nor the, the, nor the definition. Do you believe that a stationary storage tank is an above ground tank or a below ground tank? Are you, are you referring back to the, an actual statute or regulation, though? That no, FHA tank? and Fannie Mae actually put out a statement saying that they do not, they won't, they don't won't uh, mortgage for uh, within state within 300 feet of a stationary storage tank. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what's a stationary storage tank? And I looked it up, and it said a thousand gallon tank, above ground a thousand gallon tank. Yeah. I have uh, not done research on what Fannie Mae defines a storage yeah, tank. Yeah, I, I knew you wouldn't have done yeah. the Fannie Mae thing, yeah. but I, I didn't know. I assumed yeah. you would know what the definition of stationary storage tank Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in our definitions, the word stationary is not included in, in the federal or state requirements relative to, you don't have relative to tanks. underground tanks. That, that's correct. Our, our facilities don't utilize above ground storage tanks. Any other questions? Thank you. 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 I appreciate your time. Good evening, members of the board. My name is David Mastro Stefano, M A S T R O S T E F A N O. Uh, I'm in the store development department. My title is engineering permit manager, which uh, my basic responsibilities are is to hire the necessary engineering consultants, uh, design the sites, and then go through the land use approval process, including meetings like this, seeking approval of our development sites so they can be built. Uh, I am not in the real estate department, but I do work with the real estate guys on every project. The question was raised is, do we have any stores in residential areas? And we have several stores in residential areas. Just some of those stores are in Somerset, Rochester, Beaver Falls, Butler, Cheswick, and those are all in uh, Pennsylvania. We have Kent, Ohio, and Mentor, Ohio. Youngwood, which is in Pennsylvania. Patton, Huntington, Conneaut Lake, Greenville, Franklin, and our most recent store that opened is in Natrona Heights. So those are all in Pennsylvania. So you, you were talking about earlier uh, no sheet stores in residential areas, but you were looking in a small radius around the canvas. Um, these stores are in residential areas, uh, residential on one side, in some cases on three sides of the store, 
Uh, in many cases, those residential houses are significantly closer than the nearest house on Montclair to our station being proposed. Uh, so I offer that up for your thought. Now, you said uh, Natrona, it, it, you said that that's a news story? Yes, it opened up um, yeah, late, late last summer. It's where it's at the intersection of California and Freeport Road. But these other stores that you mentioned, uh, are they new stores or are they old stores? Uh, Beaver Falls is a rebuilt store. Butler is a new store. Cheswick is a new store. Rochester was a new store. Uh, Conneaut Lake was a new store. Greenville was a rebuilt store. Rebuilt meaning we had a store, we knocked it down, we built a new store. Franklin, same thing, we knocked down the old store, built a new store. Natrona Heights was a brand new store. Uh, Youngwood was a new store. Mentor and Kent were all new stores. Any questions, any comments? Right, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, may, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I won't ask you if, if in your opinion of whether um, uh, two fueling stations in, in an area would lower the property values, but do you have any empirical evidence or data that would demonstrate that it does not lower the property values? I have no empirical data. Again, I am an engineer. Okay. Um, you, that is more a real estate question. I'm sorry, I thought you were with real estate. No, I'm, I work with the real estate group. I, I am a registered engineer. And, three states. Uh, I've been doing land development work for sheets for 14 years. Prior to that, I was an engineering design consultant doing sheets designs for six years. So I have 20 years of direct experience with sheets, but I've been doing this type of work since 1984. Let me draw on your experience on something you can answer then. On those new stations that you mentioned that were in residential areas, were any of those at signalized intersections with other, with other service stations? I believe the Menor, Ohio store had a convenience store or gas station across the street. Um, Slippery Rock, yeah, Slippery Rock had residential. So Kent, and then I didn't mention, but yes, the new one we built at Slippery Rock, there was a BP across the street at a signalized intersection. You appreciate my question because we're considering tonight the potential for that to occur if we were to enact this, this amendment. I understand. Uh, the question <coughs> that we researched was convenience stores in residential areas. Um, I know of a few stores where we've actually gone in at a signalized intersection and we're the third convenience store. I know of one specifically in Ohio where we went in and all three convenience stores, to my knowledge today, are operating. We put in a convenience store and a car wash. Across the street was just a convenience store gas station, and, a, and the other side was also a convenience or a gas station with a car wash. Thank so you. it's not uncommon for us, much like you have a Lowe's and Home Depot cross interchanges, we will go across or someone will go across from us. Thank you. Thank you. Since the new double walled tanks went in I don't know how long that's been they've been in effect for but can you think of actually any time that a sheets has had any kind of a spill or, or problem be, because of the sheets since I'm not in the environmental department I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't be notified about that and I would not have to deal with that so that's really uh, mr. Cutshaw's department To follow up on that question, Sheets began using double wall storage tanks and double wall product lines in, I believe, 2001. Um, again, I can comment for the, the seven years that I've been with, she with Sheets, either in a petroleum construction role or in the environmental compliance role that I'm in now. Um, I am not aware of any incidents that have resulted in a release of petroleum because of the failure of a 
double wall storage tank or double wall product line. That were, that were attributed to a failure of, of that tank or that product line itself. There have been equipment malfunctions um, not, not associated with a release from a tank or a release from a product line, but as far as failure of those systems, I'm not aware of any in the seven years that I've been with Sheets. What kind of an equipment failure? Uh, most recently, I can think of a, a piece of equipment in the containment sump that houses the motor that pumps the fuel, that gasket um, corroded and broke, and it released fuel into the containment sump. Uh, that's one thing that I didn't get into that, that I, I should have explained. Um, any piece of equipment on that underground storage tank, whether it's the motor, whether it's the product lines, whether it's the equipment uh, within the dispenser, all of that equipment is protected and housed within a containment sump that is monitored for the presence of liquid 24-7, 365. If there is a release from a product pipe, um, it does not directly go to the environment. Uh, it goes into a containment device that's designed to be liquid tight that has to be hydrostatically tested every three years. Or it goes into a spill bucket that has to be hydrostatically tested every year. Um, there's basically no scenario where product can leak from a UST system with the equipment that Sheets installs where it would go directly into the environment. Further questions? Anyone? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, well, the public will now have a chance to uh, to speak, but address address your comments to the council and, and uh, not to uh, anyone else, not to any of the sheets people. Okay. Thank you. Um, name is Pete Menard. We are the current owners of the. Um, existing sheets property for those of you that don't remember a um, couple of things um, and I was listening and looking at the graphs and everything tonight but it's very interesting right now their count in the existing situation is something like 1600 or whatever they said stops in a given day I think that was the number um, as the owners of the property we're not going away we're not going to board that up if they put a gas station there guess what we plan to operate something there too so Let's look at the numbers that they're talking about when we're talking about total have trips to a gas station at that corner. Not only do you have to take, okay, maybe they take away 40% of our business. That still means there will people be coming to the existing property, doing what they're doing, buying gasoline, because we intend to do this, in addition to what you're adding across the street. Now, in my opinion, and I know that they are talking about the you know, the new lanes and everything. And I'm sure these are things that are good. But the main thing is, last year, well, it was in the school year, I parked or I stopped in my area and I watched. And it's probably not legal or right or whatever, but a good number of people that come walk in traffic to that sheets park in the CCAC lot and they come through that little hole and that little walk through in the fence and they go in. Now, the reason I bring that up is because if these people, these students that are coming for whatever reason, um, now what Sheets is doing is they're putting this on the other side of a busy street. Well, guess what? Now they are giving, and I'm going to use their word, I believe it was, an attraction. They have an attraction. They are attracting students to make a cross that they don't have to do now. Because guess what? They don't have to go to... Nobody crosses to go to Montclair from CCAC. I'm sure there's only, what, 17 houses there. So yeah, they're going to create, I think what they're doing is they're actually um, trying to solve a problem that they are creating by adding all of this other activity that has not existed there right now. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Menard. Anyone else? Gronsky, 136 Montclair. Um, I just wanted to mention that the uh, the 1328 in the in the zoning in the uh, in the ordinances that does still the burden of proof still goes to them for all these things we mentioned. If there's a traffic problem, 
You should fix the traffic traffic problem. If there is a uh, if there's got bad houses in the neighborhood, you don't like them, you fix those. The answer to those problems, uh, two bad houses in the neighborhood, and maybe maybe a traffic or uh, accident problem, which I don't think is exists, but he says it does. The answer is to put lights up. It's not to put a sheet in a neighborhood. He's still ruining our neighborhood. Um, I, I have pictures here if you want to see their own renderings from my driveway. They had. To, Goal to put this on access for canvas. A picture from my driveway showing that big ugly canopy up there on the highway. That's what I have to see all the time. That the dumpster I referred to straight across my driveway. It's in their rendering. Okay? They're not going to be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. Okay? They're not going to be there when the garbage truck pulls up and backs up beeping into the thing. Okay? They're not going to be there. I'm going to be there. From my bedroom window, I will everything that's going to be happening down at the sheets. I don't want to hear that. Okay? I am protected by this. I'm supposed to be protected by this council. Okay? And by the zoning law from that. The purpose of that zoning law is to keep people like sheets out of there. It's garish. It's gaudy. It's ugly. It's noisy. That's what I'm going to get in right in my front yard. And if I was the only person that was happening, though, it doesn't matter if there's only 17 people. If I was the only one, it is your job to protect me. The law looks out for me. Sheets has to follow the law. They do not have the right to ask to change the law. That's not how it works. Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, what, what uh, Mrs. Hamilton was saying. We had, um, <coughs> she said over 3,000 a day or whatever that was. I don't know if that's right or not. But it's definitely true. She said there were five, uh, five, at least five changes of the traffic lane. But now he's talking about a left turn lane, which she wasn't even wasn't even, wasn't even talking about. So now you have six versions of the traffic light. Maybe it'll help. Maybe it won't. Okay, I don't know. But I, I, we have. If um, that's definitely going to make things longer and harder, and uh, the pedestrian thing still has to. They're still not addressing that. And uh, I one other thing I wanted to say, I forgot what it was. Um, well, once again, the burden of proof goes to them. Um, no, never mind. I forgot what it was. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Anyone else? Hi, uh, I'm Jason Moots. I live on Montclair Avenue. I'm the, the real estate, um, you know, person. Um, a couple things that Sheets did not take into account with their presentation, at least in my eyes tonight, was when they rattled off this list of other Sheetses that they put in residential neighborhoods, the closest one by my account was a 45-minute to an hour drive from us. McCandless, North Allegheny School District, we are a high-income area up here. You can look at any residential housing map. They have us in a high-income area. These other areas that they're adding, like New Kensington, Cheswick, the average cost of the homes there are half of what our homes sell for up here, some, some less. Um, I don't feel that that's a fair comparison. Um, of that whole list that they've also rattled off, they could only produce three where there would be two fueling stations at a signalized intersection. And I believe only one was in Pennsylvania. They had to go to Ohio for the rest. Um, another thing um, that goes to the, the safety, um, they didn't really explain for me. When I go to sheets and fill up, I notice uh, coming out of my nozzle on a hot day, there are fumes coming out from my gas tank. I have a 2016 car. So I'm sure I have the carbon filter on it. Why are there fumes that you can readily see coming up from the nozzle? Um, another thing is I do have a well. Um, my complaint is, 50% of my complaint is the quality of the well with, you know, bacteria in it um, and their contaminants, but the other 50% you have to take into is the pressure and the gallons per minute of the well. Um, with them putting these tanks underground, we don't know how that's going to disturb the watershed. It is, is it going to severely slow down my well? Why is it my burden to have my well tested every year for contaminants and pressure? 
you know, I don't get it tested right now. Every time you get one of the well companies to come out, it's $150, $200 to run the test. Why am I, as a citizen, getting burdened with this cost year after year when I don't have to do it now, just to see if I have the same pressure and same quality I have today um, for a store they want to put in? It follows what Mike said about you're supposed to protect me, not sheets. Um, uh, and I also want to say, if the tanks are so safe, why does FHA, why has FHA not changed their guidelines about lending, you know, within 300 feet of a gas station? Stationary. Stationary, stationary fueling tank. tank. Above ground. It literally says it. It literally says it in the definition. They, I, I, I would disagree with that, and I, I will get it, I'll, I'll find an appraiser that will qu uh, clarify that I'm for sure us. I'm sure you will. I, I mean, it will be his testimony, you know, as, as Sheets provided their testimony, but I know that that is a fact that, you know, a stationary tank is above or below ground, regardless of what Google said. Um, the last thing I did want to say is what Sheets didn't satisfy for us is when we come south on Route 19, we don't feel comfortable turning into a gas station to get onto our street with this new left turn lane that they're putting in there. Um, they didn't really clarify for me if we don't feel safe turning in and out of there. How is it going to be safer for us as Montclair residents to now get in and out of our street? Um, because I know for us, we don't want to go through the, the pedestrian traffic. You know, we're afraid of hitting somebody. Um, I would like to also ask Sheets, could they demonstrate another area in the North Hills where they have diverted um, a public roadway through their parking lot back to another public roadway? I mean, it doesn't make sense as as a common sense procedure for me, let alone a traffic procedure. Um, that's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Marilyn DeSani from 8725 Casa Grande. Um, I really don't um, have any reason to, I guess, in, in so many ways defend uh, Montclair, but um, I have to agree that putting an exit or an entrance into their uh, street is unnecessary. If um, looking at your site plan, um, you have thorough access around the side of the building. There's no reason to have that additional access. So I don't think there should be any access for Montclair whatsoever. Um, you know, they also show a rendering of walls. Uh, these walls that they're going to put up, they don't provide any privacy. How tall are those walls going to be? They look like maybe a two-foot wall. That's not going to do my neighborhood, um, which borders um, Montclair. Um, it's, it's not going to do them any good. Um, with regards to the tanks, um, if you meant, remember from my last meeting, I mentioned that my husband's uh, grandfather's business dug up a tank after just 20 years, and there was nothing to it. Now, I've been in the, this current location for 32 years, and I can tell you that that Sheets has never had a, a tank dug up in the 32 years that I've been here. And I have to believe that right now it's probably leaking as we speak. And I will be there to watch it being dug up, and I can almost guarantee you that it is leaking oil or whatever it is into the ground as we speak. Um, so I will be there to observe that. Um, you know, they uh, are, at the first meeting, they were talking about encased in concrete. Now, all of a sudden, there is no encasement. Which one is it? What's actually in that ground? We're going to find out very soon. But one of the things that I'm really confused about, it was on one of the websites that I went to, it was talking about Sheets was guaranteeing us that they were going to dig up those tanks, remediate that property, and then lease it or sell it to someone else for another purpose. Well, if they were planning on doing that, one, I'd like to know why Sheets was willing to do something for their competitor. And secondly, if they did it, um, then we had no reason to have this um, adjustment to our, uh, what, what I want to say, uh, I'm looking for the word, sorry. The zoning. the zoning, yeah. Why are we changing the zoning if Sheets is going to come in and dig up those tanks and, and remediate the property and give us something else uh, in that place? It just doesn't make any sense. So which is it? Is Sheets going to dig up all that property and we're going to be able to have something else in there? I really think it's a detriment to have two gas stations in there. We already have a traffic jam there now at Sheets. The last thing we need is another one. You can't even take a left-hand turn to get to my plan from Sheets currently. If you have two gas stations, you're not only going to have traffic coming from the new Sheets, but you're going to have the old traffic from another gas station trying to come the other direction. 
it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be a true nightmare. Um, Oh, yeah. Um, went through some uh, uh, paperwork today and found an individual who had put something on our neighborhood website, and I'll just read it. Yes, there is a gas station up the street, and many years ago it leaked gasoline into the homes on Old Perry Highway. The gas company came and turned off the gas and disrupted many residents. This was a serious and dangerous situation. Our homes smelt like gasoline for days. So this is not BS, as you stated, but a real concern for homeowners in your area. Also, it would add additional traffic all hours of the day and evenings for Perry Highway. This is coming from an ind individual that lives on Old Perry Highway, and she has lived in this neighborhood since uh, April 26 of 1977. So I think there's validity to the fact that these tanks can leak and it can create a problem. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Terry Wilcox. I live at 8751 Prescott Drive. And my situation is a little bit different because I am just north of the Montclair, but I already am at a non-signal exit onto 19. And it's very, the accidents happen right there because there is no left turn lane. But I wouldn't even think of putting a gas station in to provide the funding for the road to improve that situation. It would not be a fair apples to apples trade off. What will happen, and the reason for the zoning questions is, will this improve our safety? And so the first thing that I wanted to ask that wasn't clarified was they talked about the possibility of adding pedestrian crossing improvements. Most of the places downtown Pittsburgh, like they described, when you press the button to quote cross the road, it interrupts the traffic and allows you to cross. The amount of CCAC students that would come at uh, all different times that their classes vary too, plus the people in the neighborhood and the increased traffic would not be a calculated, regulated on the traffic engineer's study. It would be interrupted at any time somebody wanted to cross there. And if you're saying, no, we're only going to leave one segment for people to cross at, they have to wait five other rotations for them to be able to turn, you just need to look at young kids and know that that's not gonna happen, which makes it even more dangerous. The second thing I'd like to say is just again, like the property owner stated, that since I live looking right down on CCAC, I live up on the hill on Prescott Drive, the kids are out all the time. And currently, I'm the person that spoke before that said that I'm out late at night when kids are out. It's a much bigger draw. And I'm a restaurant manager, and I have uh, late nights where I work. And there's not a lot open late night in our community, which is how we want it. But when you start to add 30 seats and parking for 30 and outdoor seating as well for a place to come in the summertime and alcohol may be involved, then you certainly get into a situation where there is an increased draw for students and young people to walk across the street. Um, I took on my telephone just real quick to Google while they were speaking. And four of the locations that I had time to look up that she said were residential are clearly not residential. They're in large strip mall properties. Uh, they have other retail across the street from them. So I think when they speak designing residential, it may be a situation like in the new uh, McCandless Crossing where they put some townhouses by a movie theater, but you know you're buying a townhouse that's on a parking lot. So it's not at all if they should have to come up with some documentation that shows that they're building in small neighborhoods like ours. Because if you look at the pictures and they allowed 360 rotation, there's not a house in sight within a stone's throw of any of those gas stations. Um, the second thing I'd like to bring up is uh, the owner has already stated that if, unless he choose him, sues him, he's intending to show his right to make a living from his property and run a gas station. So in my knowledge, whenever there's been gas stations across the street, they have price wars. And in this case, there certainly is going to be a reason for a little guy to try and make a living out of it. And so I think saying that two gas stations would leave the same amount of people on the road is not true. I think that there would be some activity that would cause people to want to see which one is cheaper. And that's how I choose when I get my gas usually. So in the um, violations that I looked up, there was a little tracker that said 
uh, in two out of the last three years that she's had environmental violations listed uh, from the both OSHA and the Environmental Protection Agency for environmental violations. And I got that just by clicking sheet safety on a website. Um, and I agree with the part that we said about gas being released into the air because you know after you pump gas, ladies, we usually want to go wash our hands and not get in on our coat and get the smell off of it. And then I guess lastly, the thing I just want to say is I won't be improved for my safety on the road by any of the traffic uh, improvements. It is very difficult regardless. If I, I live where you would turn left out of sheets, but no left is allowed. So I have to make sure that I go out on Old Perry Highway and turn left at the signal. And when I'm coming south, it's also difficult across the traffic to get up into Prescott to go up into my housing project. So the increase of traffic that would definitely be coming to this group, none of would improve the life and the value of my home by being also, by the way, um, one thing I noted was that uh, the landscape that they provided was deciduous and we will be able to see from my house all the light and right onto the sheets from where I live. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Craig Dover Spike, uh, 170 Montclair Avenue. And uh, as mentioned here before on the traffic, is Pendant won't allow a right turn in, from 19, and there's obviously a reason for it. So what they're doing is just turn on Montclair, it's just the same traffic. If they don't, Pendant doesn't allow a right turn, why should they allow a right turn into the sheets off of Montclair? You're, you know, you're just gonna have the same problem. Uh, other thing too is, you know, understand there's two houses at the top of the street that are going to be directly across from sheet. You know, as soon as they sit on their front porch, they're looking at the sheets. You know, right now, at least they got some, you know, a house and then there's some wooded lots to look at. The other thing too is at the end of the street, you got to think about the neighbors at the very end. It's not a proper turnaround. It's when you say a dead end street, it's a dead end street. There's, there's no turnaround. You know, so you're going to have traffic down there. And some of the, especially my driveway, it's got really low wires. I could actually touch them. So, you know, a delivery truck or something gets turned around, thinks there's a drive through there, pulls up, it's going to rip the lines down. But uh, that's it. Thank you for allowing me to speak and please make the right decision. Okay, thank you. My name is Todd Rule, 8600 Perry Highway. I'm the current owner of A Current A Comfort Service. I own the property from 8% uh, uh, of the right of way now, all the way down to the uh, Slow Buck Savings Bank. And uh, one of the things here that I really never spoke about in the past because I didn't want to appear self-serving uh, was that we really would like to stay in this area and we can't we don't have any room for expansion so what's in it for me is that when this aligns more so with Gloria to affect the singling my property line moves over I'll still own 80% of the right away there's currently a sewer line that services these buildings that are currently here and services my building that sewer line will no longer be necessary there will be a private line back to the existing uh, lateral line that runs along the back property line. This will enable us to remove almost all of our outside storage and increase the size of this warehouse, allowing us to expand our business. Uh, obviously, it's going to improve our exiting onto the highway. Currently, you have to guess which was going, which signal was uh, is uh, allowing traffic to flow from either direction. When you make a left-hand turn now, you have to worry about the uh, traffic coming north because people sneak out of the, the inside lane to the outside lane, and you can't see over the hump, basically, at that point. There's a, 
a drop off and people come flying up, up, up here and they quad and then you have to scoot across quickly. Um, the, uh, before I just didn't understand why we didn't understand the math of it, you're going to take the traffic and divide it by six instead of four. It's just simple. So the traffic that's currently coming up here, instead of it being pushed back into Montclair, now it'll be divided by three lanes and not block that intersection hardly at all. There's going to be worst case scenarios where there'll be a few cars back there, but it's going to greatly improve exiting and entering on Montclair. So uh, the other thing I wanted to say was the traffic statistics are only reported accidents being the police department was called. We dragged them right off in the middle of the yellow line and pulled them right in the parking lot. The two owners agreed to settle their issues and they go about their way. There's never any police involved with them at all. So there's probably a statistic that probably supports uh, if there's 16 accidents in two years there, there might be 30 accidents in two years. You just don't know it. So uh, we think it's gonna be a great improvement it's going to enable us to stay. It's going to enable us to remove uh, some unsightliness about our own property. And uh, the flip side also is that it's going to remove, oh, excuse my friends, the crappy buildings that are sitting there right now. And they're a traffic issue because they dump out right in the middle of all this stuff. So if you try to get out of uh, what's known as the Wolf Building, um, it's a cluster as well. So this improves everything. It improves the unsightliness of the current store, and as I think as someone said in the previous meeting, this three out of it is not going to be a gas station anymore. We're going to pull those tanks out of there, and she's just struggling with maintaining the store now because it doesn't fit the current model. Why put a gas station in there if you can't uh, make any money there? The new store will have to be brought up to the current standards that this new store is going to have. There's not going to be a gas station there. So that's the simple map of it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bull. Uh, any other, other questions? Everyone, uh, uh, my name is Robert Fraser. Um, I've owned 8500 Perry Highway since 1993. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. To, I, don't, I haven't heard anyone mention this side of it. Uh, what happens if nothing happens and this stays the same? The, the, there's four properties we're talking about there that are all, as Todd said, crap. Oh, start the clock. So, so my, my point is, I don't think anyone's mentioned this, what happens if nothing happens? Uh, there's four properties there that are, as Todd said, crappy. They're, they're dilapidated, they're run down. I own one of them. And uh, if nothing happens, they're going to continue to be that way. No one's willing to invest in their properties because there's no reason to. There's no value there. I think there's a negative synergy with those four properties that are getting more and more run down that actually hurt the property values of Montclair because they're, they're run down, they look, they look bad, but there's no really reason we can invest in them to make them better because there's no, we can't get the rents from them. It's, it's unsafe to come out of our property. The accident that happened recently was my tenant at Montclair coming out of her property that affects her business. So I think there's a negative synergy that we're, no one's mentioned because of the way the properties are and I don't think anyone's in, is even taught is willing to make a big investment in, in improving their properties. Um, her tenants are also struggling with coming in and out of that property. So there are a lot of accidents there that, from what I've heard and I've seen. I used to have my business there as well. I think also, you know, we're, and everyone can hear this, Sheets is, is giving the township a huge gift by redoing the intersection, making it safer, and bringing up the standards of PennDOT standards. It's going to be a huge gift for the area. Um, I grew up on a street where I walked up to the, the stop and go 30 years ago or 40 years ago. It was nice to be able to get a sandwich or get a loaf of bread and milk and bring it home and not have to drive anywhere. It was kind of a nice to have a convenience store nearby to access convenience, uh, whether nowadays it's gas and wine and beer or whatever too, but it's nice having a convenience store nearby and there's a, there's a plus to that which may have a positive impact on the values of these properties. Um, 
So again, that, I just wanted to say that no one's mentioned what happens if nothing happens. I think we should also take that into account because it's going, they're going to stay the same and continue to get more and more deteriorated and have more and more problems over the next 20 years if nothing happens. And uh, so I think this is a huge opportunity for the township to have a great improvement for all the tenants, not just people in, that are nearby, but a lot of people driving by can have a better place to go to get convenience items. And um, it's, it'll be a, a much better intersection, which will be much safer for people that live there. I'm sure that all the accommodations they've made will accommodate people coming from the school to go to get uh, convenience items at the store, the students, for example. Um, I think it'll be a much better scenario for everyone, yeah, ultimately. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? My name is Nancy Rupp, and I live at 231 Montclair Avenue. I just have a question for this gentleman that was just here. If he owns one of the businesses, why is he letting it run down? Why isn't he fixing up his property? It's, it's his fault that it looks like this. I mean, that just irks me, people like him. You know, we want to keep our places nice, but he's an absentee landlord is what I'm, as far as I'm concerned. And um, from the last meeting, there was a Jonathan Bernstein. He said he lives on Highland, and he does not have a problem with the current sheets location. Well, us residents on Montclair, we don't have a problem with the current sheets location either. So I don't know what he was griping about. And uh, Mr. Rule, who owns A Comfort, he doesn't live on Montclair. He has a business on 19. He gets to close up his shop and go home. I understand he lives in Franklin Park. So he gets to go home where it's quiet. He doesn't stay. He doesn't live on Montclair. He doesn't have to put up with all this stuff. And um, as far as the new traffic lights, I, it was brought up already um, about what Linda Hamilton had brought up. But I didn't even think of the crosswalks when the uh, people hit the button to cross the street. You're going to have that traffic backing up past Montclair, past going the other way. And it's just going to be a nightmare. And um, <coughs> as far as the children's safety, we had new neighbors move in a couple weeks ago. And they have two young children that will be starting school in a few years. And the neighbors across the street, she told me her son will be starting school in the fall. Um, when the bus department said, oh, there's only a couple kids that wait at our bus stop. But in two years, there's going to be more kids waiting at the bus stop. Every year, there's going to be more kids. So, so we're, like, we're urging you to reject the proposal on the basis it would be unfair to the residents living on Montclair and creating a very dangerous situation. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Rita Martin, Grubbs Road. I just have a question. Whose responsibility is it in the township to make sure that properties are maintained, whether they be residential or whether they be commercial? Is this something we're waiting for sheets or somebody else to come in and take care of, of this for us? This is our responsibility, your responsibility, to make sure properties are maintained, whether they be businesses or residential. And I don't think you're doing that in light of what's been said here. We let our properties go, hoping that some big corporation will come and scoop it up and give us all this money. That is so wrong for the residents who've lived here and invested in their properties and kept them nicely. Please keep that in mind when you're making decisions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you can come, come up for a revival. Uh, Okay, uh, never mind. They, they said, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, any, any other questions? I'll just, I don't want to create ruckus, but I, I worked at the one business there, okay? Your name and John Scroop, a resident at 87 and 500 Parkway. But I'm saying, the buildings I worked at, which I worked on the one that had the traffic at the Montclair, it's simply an older building. Dr. Woods owned it. It's not bad. But it's just simply people aren't going to invest and put everything new in if they're not going to make more rent on it necessarily. It is a, a investment property. 
So that's all I'm saying. The, the places have been there. They're all functional. They're, they're okay. But they haven't been able to rent that Wolf building in years. And I remember when it first went in, I actually worked there and put in the heating and air. But I'm just saying, I thought it was going to be a great building, and somehow it's not attracting new business. And it's probably about the same as it was since it was installed. So I'm just saying they're run down and falling is apart. This a, that's is this the property on Perry Highway? Business property on Perry Highway, 8510. Oh, okay. I, I thought that's you were talking. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other? Okay. Uh, if not, I'll move on to the next uh, thing on the agenda, and that is to uh, a notification that there will be a public hearing has been scheduled for July 23rd of 2018, as requested by Barrel Chevrolet Inc. to amend the town of McCandless zoning code to change the zoning district of certain property located on Perry Highway and Little Meadow, Meadow Road in the town of McCandless from R2, one and two family residential district to C3, highway commercial district and amending the zoning map of the town accordingly. Uh, this is something that the, uh, that, uh, the Barrel Chevrolet people brought up uh, at the Planning Commission meeting in, um, I think it was May, wasn't it, Bruce? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, and so, do you, do you what, I, I thought there were two issues. First of all, the uh, notification issue that um, um, they would, she, uh, that the, uh, oh, okay. So it's, it's I'm, I'm sorry, Bruce. it's just a notification that there will be a public hearing for, for this uh, thing uh, for, uh, for the barrel rezoning request. And it will be at the next business meeting, July 23rd? Yeah. So that'll be at the, that will be for the barrel rezoning. Right. And so what goes on at that meeting? It will be public testimony. Uh, there'll be a uh, brief presentation about what they want to do. They'll have a, a concept plan and the public will have the opportunity to comment. Yeah, I, 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 just not to belabor the point, but uh, Bruce, you said, uh, I noticed that there was going to be a, uh, I have on the map that they have something that's uh, to be dedicated for a conservative conservation purposes. And, and you said that not, that needed tightened up a little bit do you know if they've done anything on that? Or? No, uh, we haven't gotten to the point of, I think before we get, or as we're going through the process, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I don't know the council even wants to uh, rezone it, and but if we're going to do it, that will be one of the conditions right. that there has to be, it, they're proposing that there be something like a conservation easement. I don't believe that's the proper terminology, okay. is, is what I was getting at. Okay. Okay. Any questions by council? Let me see. Let me move on to the next agenda item, and that's uh, a report on, on Pashex MTRS Phase One of the Implemental Full Comprehensive Plan Summary of Public Input and Selection of Key Issues Accepted by the Planning Commission on July 3rd, 2018. Go. Ahead. Pretty much what this was, was this was the, uh, just one report on the report to the Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, is tasked with the duty of uh, reviewing and, and ultimately referring the comprehensive plan to town council. This was the end of the phase one report to the Planning Commission, which was the culmination of several meetings and a lot of public input. In fact, it was stated by Mr. Pashik that through all the comprehensive plans that he's done, that this is the most public input that's been received. And for those of you who were here when we made the decision to go with an implementable comprehensive plan, we said that that was going to be the focus point of the comprehensive plan was to receive public input and the public was going to guide this. So we had, uh, so far we've had four public meetings or four meetings with the steering committee. Uh, we started the whole comprehensive plan with a, uh, with a, a booth at Community Day, so we've received some, some uh, information from there. We've had uh, we've had uh, 
information on, uh, we've had two public meetings with input. We've then had pop-up, uh, we had a great steering committee. The steering committee volunteered to seek public input. There were two, two at the library, there were, we called them pop-ups. We had two meetings at the, two uh, opportunities at the library and one at the Whole Foods. And there were th those questions were, what do you like about, very simple, what do you like about McCandless, what don't you like about McCandless? So for all the public input, then there were uh, key, key uh, person in, uh, interviews, and there was also a, a, a municipal-wide survey, which was sent to all the residents, and they had the opportunity to respond online. And if they didn't respond online, they could call us, and we mailed it to them, and they mailed it back to us. We sent it with postage paid. All that information was gathered, uh, was reviewed by the steering committee in a variety of ways, and the steering committee selected some, the priorities, and those priorities are uh, defined on page eight, and they're put into tiers, and the tiers are tiers one, two, and three. Tier one are the key, the two key issues, and that is active transportation and connectivities. We're talking about walking trails, uh, biking trails, and how to connect various parts within the town. The community gathering space is something that was required. It was a, it's pretty much a required tier one of the, uh, it was required by town council. So that will be uh, one of the, those two key issues will be major drill downs and result in uh, reports on those two items. There'll be drawings, there'll be who's gonna do it, how much is it gonna cost, what's it gonna look like. Tier two, we started off our RFP only had four issues. Through a lot of discussion with Pashik Associated Associates, he decided to do all six issues which came, out, came about through all the information gathering that we did. And that will be tier two, uh, redevelopment, uh, we're talking about Route 19 and Blazer Drive, uh, those are southern part of Route 19 and Blazer Drive. Those are two of the key areas that we'll be looking at. Greenway corridors, how can we protect and possibly use those sites? Uh, we have uh, the Environmental Advisory Committee has already done a plan showing where all the greenway spaces are. And uh, we, or uh, Pashik Associates is gonna look at those. Community identity, uh, identity and public engagement is an item that, that came up several times. We'll be looking at that. Recreation programs and special events. There are several ways, several ways to look at that that somehow may tie back into the community gathering space. And all these items are interrelated. That's one that may be a little bit more interrelated. And then the other items that came up, which were more or less peripheral, are uh, traffic congestion, internet connectivity, public transit, and property maintenance. Those will be very brief discussions within them. Okay. within the uh, implementable comprehensive plan. Thank you, Bruce. Are there any questions by council? No, we have the full report. Okay. Yeah, this is, the full report was passed out. It is online. It has the eight-page summary and all the data that was collected is on there. And online, there should be a, an Excel spreadsheet of the data collection. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, are there any questions by the public on either of the two items we did note, the notification of public hearing for, by per, uh, Beryl Chevrolet and uh, Patrick's report? Any questions by the public? If not, the, the, uh, the uh, zoning committee meeting is hereby adjourned. I'd like to call to order the public safety committee meeting. Uh, the first is the chief's report. Good evening, I'll be brief. Um, the police report is always posted online and uh, I've got uh, really positive input about that being done. Uh, the public seems to enjoy that. Uh, one of the things I do want to touch upon is uh, I'm very excited at the beginning of the school year uh, to announce that we will have two dedicated school resource officers to greet the children this year at the intermediate and at the high school. And uh, I just wanted to thank Consul uh, when I was going through the national search and ideas and visions for the future for this police department, uh, I was an advocate of the SRO programs because I think that they make a difference in children's life, that they see a complete different perception of a police officer. 
uh, from a health and safety welfare, and we're trying or working very hard diligently to build these relationships, especially with our kids. And these, these relationships of rapport and, and, and trust, and I think that this is going to add to that. But my, my sincere thanks to Consul uh, for your support that you support these type of visions and, and programs that, that enhance uh, the police department's relationship to a better way to serve the community, and, and I thank you for that. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Chief, 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 could, can I ask you to stay close by? You might be able to help me with at least one of the right. Oh, okay. Thank then, you. Yeah, the, the parking. Okay. Um, next is to discuss the ordinance number 1473, adopted March 26, 2018, which established a no parking zone 200 feet in length at the end of Collington Square, including both turnarounds. Further reviews have been performed by the Police and Public Works Department and the town manager based upon additional input received from Co Collington Square property owners and residents. Yeah. Could I help? Yeah. <clears throat> the chief and I have gone and visited the site after uh, taking input from residents for, for about six weeks. Uh, the standard that we've uh, tried to adhere to at the end of roads that terminate in a turnaround uh, where it's difficult to maneuver for our public works trucks, uh, ambulances, uh, police vehicles, etc., particularly the two larger vehicles, the ambulances and public works vehicles. Uh, we do usually employ a 200-foot distance back off the turnaround, uh, and I, I think we may have done a, a bit of cookie cutter on when we did this. Now, the chief and the police department looked at the site originally, and uh, Public Works did, and thought it was a good idea. Uh, we have had to, to have the, the 200 feet leading to the uh, the end of the street. So, uh, got a lot of input about that, and it's clear that to us that uh, what we set out to do in, in, in primarily is to allow us to have the two turnaround areas clear so that we can maneuver vehicles back there. That's what the turnaround is for. The turnaround really should not be used for parking. Okay. Uh, but I think, Chief, and, and when you and I, we drove up and down the street several times, I took a couple photographs, we gave the photographs to town council in their packet, and I think that packet probably is out to the public as well. Uh, the, and we had, I had public works researching uh, our public works superintendent is off right now, sick, but um, I uh, had uh, people in the sign department and uh, another individual in the public works department assisting, and uh, we can find no regulation that says it has to be 200 feet. So we believe, I want to just, I just want to make sure that we're 100% sure about this and confirm that uh, I'd like to be able to recommend that we reduce the no parking zone to simply the two turnaround areas. We're going to double check on that. I, I'm looking for a little bit more background on that, but I, we're about 99% sure. I, I, I'd love to be 100% tonight, but I have, I have to state, state the facts where we stand, where they stand right now. So I think we're we're about there, and so we will we'll let know people in like know. A few weeks, I guess. Or? Yeah, well, uh, within the next couple of days, I hope. Okay. Our ex our expert is off sick off sick right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So moving on to number four. A uh, recommendation that an ordinance be adopted to repeal the following no parking restrictions on Pine Creek Road, Arcadia Drive, as shown in Town Code Section 505.04, B15 on both sides of Pine Creek Road from Perry Highway eastward to McKnight Road, B16 on both sides of Pine Creek Road from Perry Highway westward to Bellcrest Road, B20 on either side of Pine Creek Road from Minot Road east, a distance of 200 feet, and B34. Um, on Arcadia Drive from McKnight Road, westwardly, a distance of 715 feet. Public Works had recommended that uh, we uh, uh, void or repeal the sections that pertain to var various sections in the code. Uh, my office picked up two of those out of the memo that came from Public Works. So they're actually, we went back and researched and checked not only ordinances but resolutions because uh, resolutions used to be the mechanism for repealing, I'm sorry, placing or repealing uh, traffic regulations such as these. So we did find these four additional ones, and I, 
apologize that they weren't all listed in, the, in, in one batch, but uh, we did a double check whenever we did the advertising for the ordinance and saw that these other ones existed, went back with Public Works, and, and that is a confirmation there. So it won't be much expense to have a, a short repeal ordinance passed that the ad is not that long, but we do recommend that we should do that. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from Council? On the repeal, uh, Madam Chair, on the repeal of the, uh, the, the no the no parking along uh, Pine Creek Road. I mean, it's obviously a, a road that would not be subject to parking. I, it's my understanding there are other traffic, uh, I guess, uh, tra other road markings that, that would prohibit the parking and that the signage was redundant and that's why we're doing that. Am I understanding this correctly? I, th I think that uh, I'm not so sure it's other signage, but I think it's the well, it's not markings, the na nature of the road, it's not something that would that would prohibit parking there. It's not it's not a place we want to allow parking. I don't want to, I want to suggest that this this is in any way allowing parking. Being that it's that a collector road. road, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Any questions from the public? Hi, my name is Kathy Jandrakovic. I live at 9155 Collington Square. I would like to thank you all, first of all, for the input that you have all helped me with, with the signage that goes up in, uh, that has been going in the circle. Um, my neighbors and I are here not to complain about the parking situation, because I understand that it does concern the safety of the neighborhood, but the placement of the signs. I moved from the city here to McCandless five years ago because of the quaintness of the neighborhood to only come home one day to find a sign in the middle of my yard and was very disappointed. Um, I invested lots of money into my yard with the, the upkeep on the property for the resale value and I'm a little discouraged where the sign placement is. Um, whatever you guys decide to do, that's totally up to you with the parking situation, but we would like to see the signs placed maybe somewhere else where they're not as noticeable, on the curb, at the beginning of the street wherever you can do to make the neighborhood stay as quaint as it is. And you've been working on that, and we appreciate it. Okay. Just a very brief follow-up. I realize ordinarily we take the public comment, but I, I, I thank you for that. I appreciate that. And uh, like, like I said, I'm 99% sure when I get that other 100%, the only sign that will remain will be the one, one in, that's the one shows the two errors at the end yes. of the cul-de-sac. That's, right. that's our goal. So, right. And you will know. You will know what that decision is. You'll be informed. Right. by my office and uh, and then if if it's good news you, you still can come, you can still come to the meeting and <laughs> but, just uh, appreciate all your help but thank welcome. you thank you any other questions thank you Toby um, thank you. okay this closes the public safety committee meeting. the call to order the services committee meeting and invite fire marshal Dan stack to provide his fire marshal's report for the month of May 2018 and his permit report for June 2018. Thank you, sir, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be really brief because <laughs> uh, it's close to bedtime. But anyway, uh, month of May, we were extremely busy. Uh, the three fire companies ran a total of 74 calls. Um, that was pretty high. Um, so we that puts us at about 322 year to date uh, in May. Um, I think more importantly, I'd just like to report, uh, if, any, if any has, anyone has any other questions on the report, please let me know uh, on that. But uh, more importantly, uh, I'd just like to brief comments on the fantastic work that was completed on Wednesday, July 4th uh, at the uh, Commercial Structure Fire, which uh, was at uh, the Bellasario's Restaurant and Pizza Shop. Um, I'm sure um, everyone's familiar with, but uh, uh, we got called about uh, 10 minutes to, uh, to 7 on uh, the 4th of July um, in the extreme heat. Uh, we had uh, well over 11 fire companies uh, give us help, um, plus transfers. Transfers being that uh, we had outside uh, companies move into the town here to protect the rest of the residents while we were battling the structure fire in case anything else came in. So. Um, I'd like to thank every single one of them. Uh, fortunately, uh, we had uh, uh, no major injuries to report. We had numerous uh, firefighters uh, extreme um, battling uh, the extreme heat and uh, the heat stroke and everything. They were treated and released on scene, um, but uh, none of them were uh, transported to the hospital, thankfully. But um, 
just to report on the fire itself, um, it was a contained to the kitchen. Um, it, it's, uh, they sustained some um, pretty substantial uh, damage, uh, but it's not to the point where uh, they, they should not be able to recover. So uh, you know, I'd like to wish the best to uh, Bellis Areas as well. Uh, any other questions or comments from the council? Any uh, comments from fellow board members? I have I have one. I just want to commend Fire Marshal Stack on his step up program, continuing the volunteers. And I'd like to add that uh, over the Fourth of July weekend, I was at the uh, community days at Franklin Park, and I uh, observed what I hadn't seen in many years, which was the Battle of the Barrel, uh, a healthy competition between volunteer fire departments in the area. Our own Highland Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, competed there. Sean O'Brien, Norm Bogler, and Captain Congilla were there. We came in second, I believe. Marshall took the tro trophy. The point is, um, it was a great demonstration, and uh, and there were a lot of young uh, men and women there watching and uh, and encouraging volunteerism. And I'd just like to suggest that if in the future, if in some some way we can find room for something like that at our community day or some other festivity to again tie in and dovetail with our step up program and our recruitment of volunteers I think will be excellent um, thank you um, Marshal Stack thank are you, there sir. any public comments on any of the items at this time hearing none then uh, then uh, then I uh, adjourn the services committee meeting thank you very much I uh, call to order the public works committee uh, Mark is not in did he ask you there's an, there's an activity report in the packet. Uh, Jim Vetterly, senior foreman, uh, submitted that, did a nice job. Uh, tells council the, uh, uh, follow, he followed Mark's format, uh, the various uh, roads that are complete and uh, drainage is ready for the paving program and how, how much work was accomplished uh, during the month. And uh, so we pan the paving program there too. Uh, notification. Uh, resolution should be scheduled to adopt to renew the five-year agreement with PennDOT for winter traffic services and PennDOT roads within the town. These come in five-year chunks, and the, the, our, we're in the last month, the last months of the agreement. So uh, it's a renewal. Uh, the, the PennDOT sets the rates for a reimbursement. Uh, it is a great service that we offer to continue to do the state roads. No, there's no question and you can see from the entire packet that it was a, a long uh, package that they give us a, an agreement that uh, it shows that the, there are the values are higher for uh, some of the roads that we do for them such as the ramps off McKnight uh, and it, it drops down to uh, some of the uh, secondary roads but uh, the, the really the, you know this is a, it's a program that uh, this it, it really does provide a service to residents and I think should be Notification that bids are being received until 10 a.m. July 20th, 2018 for the town's 2018 Stormwater Management Facility Rehabilitation Program. This program includes reconstruction and enlargement of a stormwater facility serving the trolley court development to help counter flooding along Highland Road. Just a quick comment. I, I did want to point that out that uh, this is the first of uh, five projects in the area of the, Hi the Highland Road uh, Sloop on Ida intersection and the, the Stream Valley there and the Harmony Road that is above those streets. Uh, this will allow us to uh, accommodate a significant amount of water coming off Harmony in, before it's released off from trolley down into the stormwater system below. I'm sure the people in Highland will be thrilled. Uh, is there any comments from town council? Mr. Yes, Chairman. I, I'm sorry. Please. I Thank would just you, like to make a comment that I think Mark and his men should be commended. They finished Sloop Road and the drainage program, and they did an excellent job. It was a tremendous improvement. So I think they should be commended. I said one, one, one very brief question, and I, it involved that Buck Boulevard, which is out of our jurisdiction, but I thought perhaps two of you might know. I don't remember in the past them paving just like a, a one strip up the side. I, I recognize why they're doing it. It removed the, uh, it filled in all the, uh, the whole the potholes that were there. But had they done that, had they taken that tack before, of just doing a, 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 maybe a third, not even a third of the road, I guess, like about a quarter of the road, right up, right up, right up the hill? 
The uh, pen I used to do a modification of that uh, in the past it was called skin patching. Uh, but uh, this is, it, it's a little different, but it, you know, you know it's, it looks like a technique that they're trying to salvage the, uh, the curb line from running out further. I, 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 that, that's just, I'm just surmising that, but uh, sure, I haven't seen, it's a technique, it's not used that often, but it, it the occasionally. The technique is to, is to pave a small portion of the road rather than spend the money to, to pave the whole thing. Yes. yes, yes, and and often though this technique is used in advance of some additional paving that is coming. But that, I, I if they, they get, as you said, it's a PennDOT road. I, I could explore that and see if they have any further plans. But they've done one thing. I, I, they did the same I thing on Rochester. Rochester roads the same way. Yeah, you know. I, I'm not making a complaint. In fact, I, it's, it's it's good that that road you, you walk the hill instead of having bumps all the time. You get nice mm -hmm. nice smooth road. It works, but somehow it looks odd. That's all. Mr. Chairman, just a brief question. Do, do we have a winter services agreement for county roads in the town as well, or, or would it, does it make sense to? No, uh, the county uh, has offered a uh, far less attractive arrangement time and time again. It's, it's come up several times in, in my tenure, and uh, in town council, I reported to town council and actually brought the county in some years ago, perhaps, oh boy, it's probably 10 or more years ago, the county made a uh, Pitch to the town council, and uh, council rejected the proposal. Uh, it was pretty meager due to the reimbursement levels. Yeah, thank you. The county, however, has, has been very happy and done a much better job, I think, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we used to get a lot of field, a lot of complaints. Sometimes even pinch hit a little bit on some of the county roads. We haven't had to do that in, in recent memory. Is there any public comment? No questions here. Well, there's two. <laughs> right, I'll adjourn the Public Works Committee meeting. Uh, Finance and Personnel Committee meeting called to order. Review of the checklist number seven dated June 7, 2018 through July 3, 2018, totaling $583,000. $160.47 as submitted to each member of council and posted on the bulletin board and the town website. Any comments about the bills? Any? Um, I had one question about the um, the pen power, we had a bill for $2,000 on 627, and then we had another one for $2,279 on 7-3. Were those two different months of bills? That's 11-3-3-0 and 11-3-6-5. Let's give Reed a moment. He's, he's, yeah, got, yeah. he's got a trek up here yeah, unless yeah. he does a shout out. Well, the next question while he's looking at that was, we have Sprint and Verizon. What, how does that work? We do. Uh, we have Verizon. Uh, for some phone. We have some uh, our, uh, cellular phones uh, are split be between some members of the police department and some members of the administration. Uh, and the so main who reason. Has, who has? Who has? These are the town cell phones. Who has yes, those? Yes. The main reason, uh, uh, police uh, department heads. And I have one. And uh, the main reason why the uh, that there's a split is the police has found the uh, Sprint uh, service to be uh, improved over Verizon's for their car computers, their vehicle computers. And Verizon has been superior on the, for the use of cell phones. Um, it does look like in Penn Power that's two separate months. Is that what it was? The end of one month, and then usually you pay your electricity. I'd have to check to be sure, okay. but it, it may just be the timing of when we posted the invoices that okay. we received. Okay. We were in a transition period there where we had our finance assistant retire and okay. place her on a part time basis. Do you know when the last time we had an energy audit was? Energy audit? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it was either 15 or 16. We could check. Oh, so not too long. It's pretty ago. recent. We worked with the county on that. They ran a program to do that. Okay. We're implementing, uh, still implementing some of that, like uh, changing our light, light bulbs, okay. LED. 
Um, I know it's late. There are two things I wanted to just bring up to kind of get your response or your feelings on the, that's all, thank you, Grace, that I had. Um, was um, Toby had talked to us before about the need to replace the blazer culvert in the not too distant future, like the next three to five years. And uh, it's gonna be a major infrastructure project, um, maybe to the tune of a million and a half dollars. Um, he had also mentioned that there, we might have to raise taxes or assume debt to, to do this project. So um, while I know we'll look for whatever grants that we can possibly um, find to help pay for this, I was thinking about proposing um, charging Toby to identify some cost-saving opportunities um, of I set $250,000 a year beginning with the budget for the next year to try to start saving, maybe put in a special fund to start saving for this project ahead of time. Um, I wanted to kind of bounce that off you all and, and see what you, what you thought about that. I, I'd prefer, if we could, not have to take on debt or raise any taxes. If we got to start saving ahead of time, then maybe we could at least chisel down some of this expense. Where are you proposing we get this money? That's why we have a town manager to help us look at the budget and find cost savings. Madam Chairman, you, do I understand you to be suggesting that there might, that his mission would be, he being Toby, to identify- Well, regional, or, probably regional. Region, whoever, <laughs> but to, to, to identify a quarter of a million dollars worth of money that could be saved every year. That was just a goal I set. Yeah. We could set a percentage or we could just, I'm throwing this out for your opinion or your thoughts on it. You know, really, my, my thoughts are, you know, I'm, I'm not the finance person, but, but it seems to me if, if we could really identify a hard $250,000 using that number, when something was, was has seriously been seriously wrong in the past, I think a better objective would be to, to charge Toby with identifying what reductions could be achieved and, 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 and go from there rather than fix a number to it. I, that would that would yeah, be fine. I understand your point, but I, I think if we need a million bucks to, to, to work on Blazer five years from now, that, that that's a chunk of change. And maybe we just have to face the music, whatever it takes to do it at that point. But anyway, but those are my thoughts, but thanks. I, I do appreciate the issue. I think it's something. That hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year tax cut would come in handy right now. Yes, it would have. Yes, it would have. The uh, we will do uh, capital projections. Um, we'll be starting that process any time right now, and uh, our policy has been to uh, look at a five year rolling plan for capital budgets, and that's in the charter as well, but also uh, uh, for uh, the operating budget. We do uh, five-year projections, and uh, we submit those to town council in September. So that'll be our first pass at something like this. That was my reaction, I think, to, to you, uh, Madam, Madam President, uh, as well. And uh, uh, there are some programs that uh, we are getting a, a bead on as to the future. Uh, we, we looked at this activity report briefly, uh, but uh, our drainage systems are uh, – by and large, get getting better all the time. I, I want to get a better uh, feel for that from Public Works. That's a significant number that's in our budget now as to rehabbing our uh, drainage facilities. So there are, there are places to, I think, uh, look to try to achieve uh, what you're talking about uh, and surely uh, do our best to identify those to you uh, so that we, and then when we prepare the, the actual budget for 2019, give it to you in, in the preliminary form on October 15th and we'll have a, uh, we'll have a, a do our best to, to see what we can find. Um, we have always had the, uh, we had a position of operating uh, in, in a lean fashion, uh, not heavy in staff and so forth. Uh, I think that uh, but overall uh, that's really, a, I think a, a good comment that I can make right now is that uh, we can uh, attack this uh, as you request and just and, uh, hunker down. Uh, we, we do all the time, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it uh, and have some, uh, I think the most important thing is to have the best information available. Now, so, and the, 
we do get a bridge report every other year on this set of culverts, and they uh, are doing much better than their predecessors at the other two intersections, uh, up at uh, Blazier at near McKnight and the one near the uh, a Target store in the Pennzoil, the other end of Blazier. Uh, just a brief comment about that. Both of those culverts had curves in them, and neither of them was backfilled uh, the way that this culvert, these culverts were built at Blazier. So the, the number of three to five years we have is conservative because we do like to identify conservatively what may be a bogey on the, on the radar screen. Uh, but uh, I, I don't want to sound overly optimistic, but uh, as soon as the next PennDOT report uh, comes out that we're obligated to have uh, to receive from PennDOT, uh, we'll be factoring that in as well. And I'm going to double check and see where that stands because it's every other year. And I, so again, there are a number of factors. Uh, that, that, we can uh, we can address. Do we need to have a special account for it, or you know, like you say, for a we, we, uh, make, or so we can kind of have it separate. We uh, does it need that? What we did in, in our capital reserves is we have identified uh, our paving programs, uh, drainage programs, and this uh, this project as well, and that's that's what helps us identify. You know where, you know, what the target date might be that we would have to fund this. Uh, we started off <coughs> with uh, moving money specifically for this project. Reach, if you would like to help me, if, if you could think off the top of your head uh, how much we uh, set aside, but have batched in with our capital project. Was, uh, we're both doing this off the cuff right now, but I, I, I think you told me four hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, I believe we had started by putting aside $150,000 a year, and then we ended that. But it, it, it's all mixed together in an overall capital expenditure <coughs> projection. Um, when you're looking five years out, you're not looking at just, well, we have $1.5 million for this culvert. We also have paving every year for that five-year period to get there, and drainage work every year for that five-year period to get there. And you have to see if we think we're going to have enough funds in total to pay for all of those things. <coughs> so it's not just five years out saying, okay, we have to borrow one and a half million dollars because this culvert failed. It may be an accumulation of all of the capital projects that gets us to that point. So you That's why the five-year projections that we prepare every year are so important. So you don't think we need a separate account for, for that specific thing since well, this is such no. a large one? I, I would say no. Because we spend over a million dollars every year on our paving program. Two mil, about two million, actually. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, we know what we have set aside separately is we know uh, in 2021 to 23 dollars, approximately what that culvert replacement is going to cost. Uh, and as, as Reese said, that is a component. And what I was, you know, I, I wasn't recollecting is how many times we set 150 thousand dollars at the, at the several year number of years ago toward that we, as he said, if we're batching everything, that's, that was my recollection, but I wanted to confirm that through you. I appreciate it. Yeah, all we were saying at that point was, okay, we've got, say, $2 million in the capital fund, 150000 of that you can't touch for paving because we're saving that for the culvert, possibly. And we took one other significant step in, I think it was 2015, when council set the policy at the recommendation of Reach and me, and as per GASB, Government Accounting Standard Board, is that we uh, transfer monies that we were holding in the operating fund to the capital reserve fund, keeping only what we need to operate for two months in the uh, operating fund, the higher of either uh, two, two months of expenditures to uh, refresh my memory. I thought it was three months. Two. It's two, isn't it? The average of Two months over the past three years. Two months over the past three. I knew those are three. Two, two months over the past three years that we keep in the general fund, and then everything else goes to the capital reserve fund, and then we match that up against what our capital projects are for the next five years, and that's where we know how you know how well we're doing, and how, would we have have to? Part, I think part of the answer to your question would be if if we have to, we should be looking at uh, you know, are there ways to reduce operating expenditures. I mean, I don't think that's going to be an easy task because we do operate lean, but I think, if, you know, you're, if you're ta that, that's your tasking, I think it's a good tasking to, 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 uh, for us to come back and say that, yeah, we found something. 
I think we need to try. No, absolutely. I think absolutely. we need to try. We, we have, we have uh, operated between somewhere between frugal and optimal over my tenure here. And uh, it's, it's good to optimize. And, uh, and there's the old, there's an old saying about being penny wise and pound foolish. But I, th I think that, there, you know, that we, we, uh, we do have the second lowest tax rate in Allegheny County, real estate tax rate. Uh, we have a healthy uh, uh, commercial sector in our business privilege tax, which is, has, has been growing in our budget. Uh, our earned income tax, it's not quite flatlined, but it has gone up since the new law was passed uh, about six years ago that uh, required uh, mandatory uh, withholdings. There have been a number of good factors. Uh, it, 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 it could be with inflation that it's going to be inevitable someday that there's going to be a tax increase. I, I understand that the mission is to try to forestall that as long as we can. Madam President, while we're throwing things out, I, I, I would like to add, though, I would not like to see a reduction in services, and I don't think that's what you're advocating for here to save money. Um, I, I will say, and I'm not advocating for or against, but when we make decisions on development, we have to remember that that does have a financial impact to the town and to our revenues and to our ability to not raise taxes. The town's gone on for many years, self-funding all of their capital requirements without a tax increase. I know that as an example of development, McCandless Crossings is now, I believe, the single largest source of revenue, tax revenue. Real estate revenue. Real estate tax revenue for this town. Didn't exist <coughs> five years ago. And, and Councilwoman Powers and, and McKim, you can correct me, but I believe that was the source of the, of the tax cut was the, those additional revenues that were found uh, that you wanted to return back to the taxpayers. So, I think we need to look at both sides of the ledgers to solve this problem without impacting the taxpayers. Uh, I certainly would not advocate for reducing services, though, but it's a worthy endeavor to uh, well, that, that, tighten our belts. Why, that's why I make the comment to, to make our objective, sort of, at least initially, what is possible. We don't want to do things that don't make sense just to, just to make a splash. Yes. You know, or, or, or constrain ourselves unfair, unrealistic way. I mean, we could say, gee, let's, we could solve the whole problem by, by doing something, you know. Dr draconian cost savings draconian would not be cost savings, that's right. a solution, no. So do we all agree that we want to look for, I think I said, cost saving opportunities? Yes. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Those yeah. are my exact yeah. words, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Do we like that? Always okay. Right. So, all right, good. All right, good. The other thing and the last thing is, um, Best financial practices requires a periodic evaluation and RFP of professional services. I would like to throw out what you think about developing a written process to implement this type of evaluation to be considered, you know, for us to consider. Um, I think contracts and fees um, should be reviewed and approved by council regularly. What do you think about that? I agree. Comments on that at all? Anything else about that? Madam Chair, where were you reading? I, I guess I heard what you said, but I, I couldn't see. That right was now. my extemporaneous. She's, she's, uh, yeah, she's, 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 she's yeah. reading out of her notebook. It was her. It was her. It's, did it sound very famous or something? I, gotcha. <laughs> I thought it was on the agenda. Just make sure. Uh, just make sure you sign it. Yeah. We we. Yeah. Uh, do use a quoting process. Uh, are you talking specifically about any any services? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know that I know specifically what I'm talking about. I just have not seen um, something in place where it says we review the maintenance of the building every th three years. We look at their contract, or we put out to see if, you know, anyone else wants to bid on, if bidding's not the word, have an RFP on, on that service. That, that's, I mean, I just haven't seen any of that. So I thought that would be good for those things um, to be, you know, at four years or whatever time we set, four years you review this, it, you know, so we can look over them. So we don't accidentally say, gosh, it's been 35 years since we re reviewed well, there there are some professional services that, it, that well, it's, whether it's 35 years or 20 or, or a lot of years, uh, one of them would be engineering services, uh, which we keep a track of as, as to how competitive the rates are. But that that example is a strong example of uh, the relationship of good performance and and, and prudent.
to have to have someone on hand, especially when they in, you know, are involved in GIS and, and other projects. As far as something like the maintenance contract, uh, because of the size of it, it falls under my purview under the Home Rule Charter. That to, was an example. Okay, to take quotes, it's it, that's a it's a small that's kind of a smaller potatoes and and, uh, and it's so we do uh, check bids on that every other year on that one, but. But there, there, there. It was, I think it's. You did ask me when we had met to uh, start working on a list and, and look at areas where we could uh, talk about RFPs and bring that to the board's attention. And I have started on that. Good. I think engineering actually should be included in that. Um, I think we need to look at all of them. I think council needs to look at those contracts, and I think we need to. Relationships are important, but also we need to, for companies to realize that we want the most. Um, we want good services and we want good prices too and I think many times companies become complacent when they just are given contracts year after year I think it's a good idea to have them come up and, and let us see you know to, to review those contracts I think it's a good idea Bill likes it you okay too. you guys like it okay okay all right, that was all I've had. Um, any comment, council comment on any of these items? Citizen comment? Okay. Um, the Finance and Personnel Committee is adjourned. I'd like to call to order the Recreation Committee, and at this time we have nothing new to report. And then I'd like to move to. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I, I, I would like to add something in the recreation area okay. before you proceed. I attended a, uh, an annual baseball tournament at Fessel Field uh, in the, at the end of June. Four teams, it's a great, great day, great weather, great two days really. But one thing that be between the parking lot and the Vestal Field, there's a very nice walkway, and I'm not, I'm not sure, is, is that a, a was, was that developed by the, by the town at some point? Designed and built. Permits submitted to DEP and approved by DEP, all by our internal folks, Public Works Department. Okay. The bridge over so, the River Pine. What is, what I find really vexing, and I'm sure you share it, because Toby and I walked down that pathway. Uh, it's very nice, fortunately the wood has not been destroyed, but some numbskull was down there almost every season. And how many lights are there? Like 35, 40 nice. lights, all the way down, they smash all the nice covers smash the light bulbs inside it. I have no idea how much money that cost, but I remember specifically you and I walking down there one year and, and, and saying, holy cow, we've done it again. I think we ought to be, uh, we're going to have to raise a solution right now, and I'm just wanting to raise it so somebody can really look at that and think, are there some kind of iron cages we can put around the lights to keep them from doing that? Or should we just say, look, you want to destroy the lights every year, we're just not going to have lights. But it seems to me it's it's, it's got to be a uh, not not a, not a not a budget buster, but it's a pretty significant expense that occurs because of this random act of violence. Yeah, the, the random act is also we have Lexan covers on the lights, and uh, it, it's it's pretty uh, strenuously random. That's that's for sure. You could say that would be a, in the past tense at this point. Right. We had nice. I don't know what else. I mean, the only thing we can do is. I'm not even sure whether some some vandal could defeat that if you, if you put literally cages around it. I was looking at iron cages and then keep them from walking by with a baseball bat and destroying it, or, or whether that could be defeated by poking something through them. I, I don't know. But it, it really is irritating. That, that's all I want to say. I just wanted to raise it and put it on our radar screen again. I think there's something to mention in that. They might come up with some idea that we could put something around it. I'm not sure that would be the solution, but I'm just saying that that's that's what that, that thought occurred to me. Any other comments from anyone? No, thanks for giving me a moment to say that. Any citizens? I close the recreation committee and then would like to move to go into executive session. Second. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, all in favor? Uh, uh, against. Sorry. Is there an against? Who seconded? I 
I seconded, and there doesn't seem to be an against. No one against. <laughs> Yep.